Я вітаю вас, шановні пані та панове. Dear ladies and gentlemen, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. I am happy to welcome you, and it is a big honor for me to open the sixth Ukrainian Women's Congress. You know. On my way here, I got a little bit lost. I went to a different hotel, and I thought maybe something is wrong. But I got here, I got here on time, and I thought, well, these are dark times, difficult times, the war. Maybe we shouldn't have held the Women's Congress. But it is definitely not about the women who are standing here, who are holding our defense, who are inspiring this Congress, and I think even these dark times, light of women's hearts and our strengths are inspiring. And to open this Congress, I have the honor to invite Vice Speaker of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine and co-founder of Ukrainian Women's Congress, Ms. Olena Kondratyuk. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear sisters and brothers, your excellencies, it's 258th day of Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine, against the values of a free world and a happy future that Ukraine chose, a war against freedom and equality, against democracy. But strong and confident Ukrainians are working on the front line and in the rear to give us an opportunity to meet up today and hold these discussions at Ukrainian Women's Congress. Before the beginning of our work, I would like to ask you in honor of the memory of our defenders, innocently killed men, women and children, to hold a moment of silence. Thank you. Today we have to give ourselves our own word to punish the war criminals. We have to make our world better. We have to promise to never get tired of standing up for equality and respect. We have to promise to get together with democracies across the world because only if we unite efforts can we stop absolute evil? And we have to promise ourselves to be relentless in our struggle and our work. We will achieve success based on our values. And the primary value is the truth. The truth whose voice must give and has given women equal voice. The truth which supports women in equal decision making and equal pay. The truth which will ensure a more fair world for our children. And that is why I am happy to welcome you, tireless, relentless participants of our Congress. And I would like to thank everyone who has participated in organizing this event during massive blackouts and unprecedented Russian attacks on Ukrainian cities. I want to thank our international partners who support Ukraine in the military, defense and humanitarian sectors and who support our efforts to achieve equality. And on behalf of the founders of Ukrainian Women's Congress, Maria Ionova, Svetlana Vojtsakhovska, Alena Babak, please let me, to, let me announce the sixth Ukrainian Women's Congress values during the war open. When we speak about values during the war, the equal values are respect, mutual help, humanity, optimism, strength, and inventiveness. This war is about millions of women and children who sought to save what is most precious to them, the future generation. They went to foreign unknown countries, often with a minimum of uh, items and uh, money, not knowing what expected them. But having gone through all the bureaucratic procedures, all the um, aid centers, they had the responsibility to start learning the language, to find a job, to send their children to uh, local schools and 
preschools to set up their life in a new place, often with tears in their eyes, missing their home, being separated from their families and their homes, dreaming of coming back home every day, but understanding that while it is temporary, it is necessary. And this is uh, better because it helps to f those who are on the front line to fight when they know that their wives and their children are safe. Despite the challenges of the war, which have given significant challenges to Ukrainian mothers, who are now fearing of losing their loved ones. Ukrainians are bringing the values of kindness to European society. They are learning and adapting quickly. With their example, they disrupt the uh, stereotypes that Russian propaganda spreads about Ukraine and Ukrainians. And I am especially thankful to our women's movement, doctors and psychologists who provide aid to uh, girls and women and men who suffer from violence and war crimes of Russian troops. We are thankful to our volunteers, entrepreneurs for their help. We are thankful to leaders of local communities where we have women most represented, energy, the emergency services, utility services, those who maintain our peaceful life and give us an opportunity to have a meeting here today. Meeting many leaders of European countries uh, Prime Ministers and MPs of European countries, we constantly speak about Ukraine's post-war recovery. It is an enormous mission where women alongside men have to play a key role. And our joint task today is to provide women with access to decision-making and to a fair distribution of resources in the process of Ukraine's recovery and in strengthening the European architecture of security. It is p peace and security in the whole Europe that 50,000 Ukrainian women are fighting for as part of the Ukrainian army. I am proud that a third of our army is represented by uh, strong women. It is one of the highest results in all NATO countries. And this means that women know how to build, how to develop, how to teach, how to raise children, build a career, and if necessary, defend their families and their country. And this is the new reality and new opportunities for women which need to be recognized and which cannot be overestimated. They need to be used. Our future has to be based on respect to rights and equality. That's, that's why Ukraine implemented the Istanbul Convention, which we as Ukrainian Women's Congress uh, had been fighting for. And here it shows that uh, we are the country of freedom, respect and values. And that is why I, I am happy that we are focusing on values here in our Congress. The victory in this war and recovery of the country has to create the best atmosphere of equality and creativity, the feeling of uh, new justice, because we have gone through all the terrible things about the war. And it's, it, it will be very important to have sensitivity to veterans, people with disabilities, who sacrificed their health and lives. And of course, we need to uh, pay a lot of attention to education and awareness. The war always st starts where the freedom of speech disappears, where one nation tries uh, to conquer another, where there is no fair elections, no competitive economy and disrespect and violence towards women come in their place. And that is why we need uh, to place our values, values of a democratic Ukraine and the world in the center as a roadmap so that we can build this just and uh, happy future for Ukraine. You, the war showed the eternal values of love, faith. We we believe uh, in uh, God and in the armed forces of Ukraine. We have one common hope which unites us. That's a hope for our victory. And we found out what love is. The real love to a man or child, parents, love to home, to your motherland. And the fourth value, which goes together with faith and hope and love, that's wisdom. And I'm sure that we have enough of this wisdom. 
And of course, uh, good mood and a uh, good sense of humor, that's what saves us. And uh, with this confidence and optimism that we have here in this room, I want to thank all of you and to say that we are planning to have incredible work here. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you for being with us. Glory to the heroes. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Olena. And now we have video address uh, to the participant on the Congress. Uh, comes from First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska. Let's listen to her. Dear friends, I'm very happy to come back to this Congress. Last year, this time, we talked about equality in opportunities, the job market. We talked about BRE's partnership, which is fighting for this equality and that Ukraine joined. We talked about uh, the accessibility, which is not only physical, but uh, social and uh, psychological for every Ukrainian person. And today, if this were the peaceful time, we would talk about achievements in this uh, all these areas. But I about uh, our country becoming more comfortable and uh, more equal. But today I'm talking about Ukrainian women during the war. We, each of us, on all international events which I visit, uh, where I share the truth about Russian aggression in Ukraine in all interviews that I give, this is the most popular question. Tell us about Ukrainian women. And it's not just a random question. Ukrainian women in their fight uh, in these terrible challenges that's real strengths. For example, this year, John McCain a Prize was given to Ukrainian women on uh, public service in Ukraine. And I want to share this uh, prize with you, dear women. When I'm telling the world about Ukrainian women, I'm talking about 40,000 of uh, women in the front, in the armed forces of Ukraine, and also about our doctors, uh, teachers, who are doing their job uh, regardless about our business women, because one third of the businesses are on their shoulders. They are holding our economy, about our heroes who went through being captured and uh, living in occupation, about millions of those who left their homes to protect their children. And I'm telling uh, stories of uh, particular women so that uh, these uh, people were not just numbers, but real stories. I'm telling the story of Olga Suhenko, uh, who was killed in her community, about the kindergarten teacher of Olena Pisotska, who saved uh, children, about Olena uh, Sokolova, who was uh, delivering babies uh, near uh, Mariupol, about Tyra and Tashka, who were prisoners of war, and Oksana Leontieva, who saved children, but uh, she lost her life uh, because of Russian missile. There are more stories like this, and every story takes a piece of your soul, but also it demands us to be stronger for them, for others, for victory. And uh, over these uh, nine months, uh, women live not only with constant danger, but they learn to live with this. We have to. And we know how. Ukrainian woman knows how to deliver humanitarian aid and evacuate from the most difficult places, to be good at drones, weapons, tourniquets, to prepare bomb shelters. And now they are good at power generators. So each woman is the state emergency service worker, teacher, doctor, they can do all the tasks. They don't need a book about uh, how to be efficient. They are efficient. So that's why when I'm asked about the role of Ukrainian woman now, that's a leadership role. Because a leader is not just one person. There are, can be many leaders. To be a leader, it means to give more than you get and to inspire Ukrainian women this who they are. And it's very important that for the motherland to do this for them after the victory. And now I'm coming back to the conversation from last year, because it's still relevant, because we talk about accessibility, equal opportunities in salaries, attitude. That's what society needs to give back after the victory. And I always say that we need the we need to have a person in the center, especially a woman in the center. 
so that women can come back to their homes, to their hometowns, uh, to their regular activities. But the state needs to create conditions for this, to restore kindergartens, uh, to restore workplaces, uh, to create health care systems. And we already started working on this. We started this process of recovery of Ukraine is starting now because the bright future, that's what we need today, not someday. And I'm sure that every Ukrainian woman will join in the way how they are joining uh, our victory. And I want to thank the organizers of uh, this Congress. We all understand how in these times of air raids, power outages, uh, how difficult it is to organize a big event so that it is effective and safe. But you manage to do that. You keep working so that we talk about uh, women and women issues even during the war. E even so, it's important to talk about it, about uh, the war. This is your front of protecting women, and you are fighting at this front. Thank you, Ukrainian women, for everything, for each of you. Of course, uh, let's uh, thank Olena Zelenska, and in her warm words, uh, you probably heard something about you, about your friend, about a member of your family. And just in a few minutes, we'll start our first uh, panel, the leadership of Ukrainian women during the war. But before that, I want all of us to listen. We will have the address of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia, Lithuania, Croatia, Germany, Romania, Austria. Of course, they would like to be here with us, uh, to be in Kiev. But because of the war, they uh, could not be here. So they decided to make this video uh, all together. So let's listen to them. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for us to speak at the 6th Ukrainian Women's Congress. A few days ago, we, a women European delegation, had the chance to visit Kiev. We met with many courageous women who demonstrate impressive resilience and leadership. These women's courage and strength is what inspires Europe, the world and us personally. It is important that women have a strong voice and we all move from the empowering of women to more women in power. History has shown that women and girls are particularly affected by crisis and by conflicts. Therefore, it is important that women have a stronger voice and play a more visible role in the decision-making process. Having said that, if we look into the consequences of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine from the women perspective, the majority of 8 million Ukrainian refugees in European countries are women. 50,000 Ukrainian women are currently in the armed forces and 5,000 of them fight on the front line. Also in this war of aggression, women and girls are among the most vulnerable groups facing devastation, loss, exploitation, trafficking and sexual violence. We therefore reiterate our firm commitment to holding Russia and all perpetrators and accomplices to account and our strong support for the investigation by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. In line with UN Security Council Resolution 1325, we, as European women with political responsibility, call for a more active contribution of women in the decision-making process now and in the future when Ukraine will be reconstructed. As demonstrated since 24 February, we will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Ladies and gentlemen, the leadership and the contribution of Ukrainian women is remarkable and inspiring. Let's continue to work together on all levels. Let's support each other. Women of courage can overcome anything. Thank you. So I want to welcome all of you once again. Now we have a bit more light and we are starting our first uh, panel, the leadership of Ukrainian women during the war. And uh, before I uh, introduce our charming uh, men and women in this panel, when I think about leadership of women, I really like one phrase, which is uh, pretty old, and uh, s uh, some people say that it's, uh, it came from uh, Golda Meir or from Hillary Clinton. Women are like tea bags, so it 
it's not clear what's going to happen before you put it into boiling water. And maybe it's a bit naive comparison, but I think we were put into this boiling water right now. And war is probably the most terrible boiling water temperature that we could imagine. Even a year uh, ago, none of us had the thought that uh, next uh, year we would be in this uh, building so which can protect us uh, from the possible attack of Russian missiles. You know that they like Mondays. So women have their front line, and uh, women are strong, especially Ukrainian women. That's why it's. I'm glad to start our first panel, and uh, let me introduce uh, all our guests first. So at first we will have uh, the introducer, Nato Mekace, from uh, OSC. Uh, director of OSCE, and then also we'll have online Victoria Chmilita Nielsen, speaker of the same as of uh, Republic of Lithuania, but uh, she will talk to us online. Then Solomia Bobrovska, member of the Parliament of Ukraine, uh, welcome. Uh, Marcin Valetsky, NDI uh, Senior Resident Country Director in Ukraine, welcome. Yana Zinkevich, member of Parliament of Ukraine. And, uh, so, uh, and uh, also Yulia Tairapayevska, uh, we read a lot about you and uh, now you're sitting next to me, it's a great pleasure for me. Katarina Sacha, today she's not wearing her hat, but uh, she does a lot, let's welcome her. And Helena Savruk, you all know her, she's managing partner of the uh, Mohila Strategic Agency, and uh, she's also sh she's uh, working on the program uh, strategy of architecture. We read a lot about her, so that's what we are going to talk about. But uh, let's start with uh, Matteo Macaccio, director of the OCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to speak to you today at this six Ukrainian Women's Congress. As you know, ODIR, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of the OSCE, has supported the Ukrainian Women's Congress since its establishment in 2017, and since then it has gone from strength to strength. It is clear from today's point, standpoint what an important initiative this is. The need for gender equality and women's leadership is higher than ever following the Russian Federation's military attack in Ukraine since February this year. ODIR over the years has, has played an important role in strengthening democratic institutions and respect for human rights in Ukraine, and particularly since launching a dedicated project in 2015 that is still ongoing. Our support for gender equality initiatives has played an important role in this. We have helped to build the capacities of Ukrainian human rights defenders, gender advisors, and other human rights advocates working in the area of human rights monitoring, prevention of human trafficking, the rights of people with disabilities, and Roma rights. We have also supported the Ukrainian parliament in its efforts to introduce a code of ethics for parliamentarians and to improve the regulations governing the financing of political parties. After the armed conflict began this year, with all its tragic and sometimes unbearable consequences, especially for civilians, ODIR launched a program to monitor the most serious human rights violations in Ukraine. Since then, we have interviewed over 100 witnesses on the violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, including witnesses of gender-based violence directly related to the conflict. Through this documentation, as well by assisting prosecution and investigation platforms, ODIR supports national and international efforts toward ultimately ensuring accountability. The consequences of the military attack in Ukraine have often been different for women and men. It is overwhelmingly women who are fleeing the war, with 95% of refugee women and children who are often vulnerable and traumatized. In times of conflict, women are at high risk of sexual and gender-based violence, particularly given the breakdown of the rule of law and the overall disruption caused 
to the work of the state institutions. Following an alarming number of reports of traffickers targeting women and children fleeing Ukraine, combating human trafficking has also been a key aspect, a key aspect of this work since February this year. At the same time, we must be careful not to objectify or stereotype women as victims. Not only, since February, we have seen the courage of women defending their country, whether in the armed forces, security sector, politics, or civil society. Indeed, the brave women, human rights defenders from Ukraine Center for Civil Liberties, were honored this year with the Nobel Peace Prize for their commitment. Promotion of gender equality is the primary responsibility of the states, individually and collectively. That being said, a vital aspect of our work on gender equality is to serve as a platform for discussion, bringing together all those involved, from public institutions, international organizations, and civil society. To make progress, it is important that we all call with one voice for the equal participation of women and men in every sphere of public life across the OC region. Violence against women active in political life is also a growing problem for women across the OC region and beyond. And I'm proud to say that just today, we are also launching a new toolkit specifically to address violence against women in politics. This is the latest example of our increased efforts, not only to prevent such violence, but also to encourage women's participation in public life. Ladies and gentlemen, the OSCE recognized many years ago that equal rights for women and men and the protection of all human rights are essential to sustainable peace and security. Let us work together towards that reality. I wish you therefore a fruitful discussion today and the very best of luck for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to remind you that it was Andrea Matteo Mekacci, Director of OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And now we will have online uh, communication uh, with Victoria Schmille Nielsen, Speaker of uh, the same of uh, Republic of Lithuania. Welcome, Victoria. First of all, uh, from all Ukrainians, uh, I would like to thank you. I want to thank uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and all Baltic countries uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful support that you provide to Ukraine, especially, especially to the Baltic countries. I know that uh, you allocated uh, 650 million euros to support Ukraine, maybe it's more. And one of the interviews you mentioned that uh, you need to be this icebreaker so that uh, Western uh, European countries uh, not to be tired of uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, it's a good comparison to be an icebreaker. And I understand it's not easy to support Ukraine. So why did you use this uh, particular comparison and why is it difficult to support uh, Ukraine in Europe now? People have come together in the effort to extend our support uh, in whichever way possible because, well, we really understand both the horrible reality that you are faced with every day, but also um, how close this war is to uh, us, uh, how close this war is to Europe, and that it is a war on the whole of the democratic world. Uh, I believe that Lithuania and other countries in the region um, have this special role of being icebreakers. Sometimes we are... Uh, 
incapable to uh, provide as much help as possible just because of our size and capabilities. But nevertheless, in terms of uh, political, diplomatic uh, help and role, uh, we have a chance to, um, uh, to bring the message uh, of uh, how important it is to uh, keep the focus on the war in uh, Ukraine and on Russia's aggression, on condemning Russia's aggression on a daily basis. So that that I believe is one of the important uh, roles of Lithuania. And of course, um, I really hope that uh, in the upcoming year, um, well, all of us can meet in uh, already peaceful and victorious Ukraine. So today we talk a lot uh, and we worry that uh, the world not to have the fatigue from Ukraine for Europe, not to feel this fatigue. I want to ask you, we want to ask you as a big supporter of Ukraine. So why nobody says that like the world doesn't have fatigue about Russia? Why nobody is saying that, that the world is tired of Russia, especially Ukraine is tired of Russia? So are these voices heard, at least in your country? Well, definitely, I would say that um... Well, there is no doubt in our minds that um, the only uh, possible and uh, reasonable outcome of the aggression uh, of the war in Ukraine is Russia being uh, defeated, uh, Ukraine restoring its territorial integrity and uh, becoming a full-fledged member of European Union, becoming uh, potentially also a member of the Northern, uh, um, well, the NATO uh, and other organizations that it aspires to become. And um, when it comes to, um, well, to the fatigue of war that is often discussed uh, in uh, uh, you know, with in, in our talks, in our discussions with uh, other leaders from the Western European countries. Well, um, I think it is important that the focus is um, with um, the tragedy of Ukrainian people. And um, since uh, we all are following the events unfolding daily, we all are sympathizing with um, the Ukrainian people. I believe that this um, is going to be the uh, glue that keeps our unity. And as the uh, previous months have shown, um, this um, unity sometimes brings uh, unprecedented uh, decisions, uh, the way that uh, Ukraine has been granted the EU candidacy status, the way that um, the sanctions have been imposed on Russia. That is not to say that this um, process is finished in any way. We see every day that there is more and more need to demand an even stronger voice and with even stronger measures, more help, more weapons to Ukraine and also more sanctions against Russia. That's nice to hear that. And another question is that I know that you are helping a lot to Ukrainian women who are now in Lithuania and you help them to integrate into their normal life and uh, you support launch of language classes, you help the women to find jobs and their children to attend schools. But maybe my next question will be a, a bit strange because, well, every woman from Ukraine who travels with children, well, that gives me a lot of pains because I know that children are important anchors and where women see their children speaking Lithuanian or French or German when they have friends, when they have and their gangs and actually the community where they communicate, maybe the women would start thinking, maybe I should not come back because it is peaceful, it's okay, there are no Russian missiles here. You know, it always gives me concerns that maybe they will never come back. I understand that it's too early to speak about that, but what are you thinking about that? Of course, we are looking forward to their coming back after we win the war, but this is still about integration process. The more integrated they are, the less the chance that they will come back. So how can we make it so that they survive the war but come back? Well, I would say that um, 
it is a very important point for us to provide as much help as necessary for the war refugees from Ukraine. In Lithuania, we have hosted so far more than 65,000. And of course, most of those war refugees are women and children. And um, well, we're trying to do whatever it takes so that they feel temporarily at home here. But at the same time, um, I have a chance to talk to uh, many who come here and it is very clear, there is no doubt in my mind that basically all of them see this as a temporary home and they look forward to coming back to the to their peaceful Ukraine. This is a very, very strong sentiment that we see. So on the one hand, um, people who come here, um, they really want to integrate quickly. They want to perhaps put also put 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 away the uh, horrendous experience of war and live here very sort of fully contributing to uh, also the life in uh, this country, in Lithuania, so that we really appreciate. But at the same time, we even um, do not call um, uh, war refugees from Ukraine war refugees, but just temporarily displaced people who are looking forward to going back and rebuilding Ukraine. And that, I think, is uh, you can feel very strongly. But also on that respect, I would like to say that the courage and the sacrifice and the leadership of Ukrainian women has been um, very inspiring throughout this whole time. I have heard in the introduction, many have mentioned the uh, amazing courage of Ukrainian women who are actually fighting in on the front lines. And that, I believe, um, is a, a very important point, which also um, shows that women are not only leaders in so-called softer issues like peace negotiations, like humanitarian causes, but Ukrainian women show all the um, aspects of uh, female strength in this uh, conflict in defending their homeland. This is very, very impressive. At the same time, what I would like to say is that, um, uh, well, I think that the decisions that Ukraine has taken during this time, um, uh, like, for instance, uh, human rights decisions, uh, ratifying Istanbul Convention, despite the fact that it's during the war, also shows um, the uh, readiness uh, to uh, integrate as quickly as possible in the European Union, in the European uh, family, and with the European values that are part of your DNA. That is also very impressive, that despite of the raging war, these important decisions are taking place. And um, lastly, well, you know, the victory that will be there, be Ukraine's, will equally be the victory of Ukrainian men and women. And women of Ukraine have shown um, amazing, amazing um, example of uh, the leadership that I think are um, an example for all of us, uh, both politicians and uh, ordinary women all around the world. And I really, well, uh, you know, I, I, I extend my biggest um, respect for, for that to you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you for having this trust in our women and supporting our women, and thank you for your trust in our victory. Thank you again for your support for Ukraine in the, this war. So, uh, Victoria Chmileta Nielsen, the speaker of the Lithuanian Sejm. And we continue our panel discussion, and now we are going to talk to representatives of Ukrainian authorities. I would like to invite Salomia Bobrovska, Member of Parliament of Ukraine. So, Salomia, in October this year, as far as I understand, you became a member of the Committee for National Security and Defense and Intelligence. And I've read a lot of interviews and your posts. You write a lot about the inner front in Ukraine. I'm speaking not about women, but about that. Unfortunately, in Ukraine, there are still people who support the Russian world, who are traitors and collaborators. And you, as a representative of the Committee for National Security, so can you share what's your vision on fighting that? Because when I listen to those songs in Kiev Pechersk, where they praise 
uh, the Russia, where Bogusliev says that, well, we understand, Putin, that you're dropping bombs on us, but we uh, kind of understand you. And that's happening uh, in the situation of the war at the strategic side. So how shall we, um, what shall we do about that? Good afternoon, good morning, and thank you, uh, Victoria, because uh, she was one of the first women who participated in international, uh, who was a member of international delegations, who were the first actually to come here uh, with other Lithuanian colleagues. And that's a, uh, an example of very good advocacy, where their messages are sometimes better heard than ours. And Lithuania, by the way, is um, a role model of uh, how they managed to overcome, uh, at least in, pub in public domain, that kind of collaboration in religion, music, culture, etc. I love because I've just received a, a claim to court uh, from Rivne region, from one of Russian church uh, priests, uh, and uh, Rivne region is one of the highest uh, conflict uh, um, regions. So now I am invited to court. That's a good question. So now um, opposition parties uh, uh, call on the speaker to um, discuss the draft law on prohibition of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, but there is still no political will to do that. Uh, unfortunately, we do not broadcast Verkhovna uh, Rada uh, sessions for those people who have access to digital or analog um, broadcasting channels, frankly speaking, our um, territories closer to the border still do not hear Ukrainian television. And thus, uh, they don't hear what uh, MPs are talking about. They can only rely on YouTube. And uh, we know that in deoccupied territories, there is no con um, communication and we have electricity shut down. So nobody is going to see that. And when we Yes, here that there are quite a lot of people who are parishers of the Russian church. Well, it is difficult to prove that uh, Russian church, it's not about the religion, it's about national security, that this is a network of agents that has developed for a long time in the territory of Ukraine. And it's so shameful that uh, Ukraine is appealing to the world to provide support to uh, introduce sanctions that we still have factions and uh, out of faction MPs who are suspected of uh, state treason and they are still members of committees they still have their mandates Andriy Dakach is a good example or Yuri Boyka who was at the briefing on the 24th of February at 7 a.m. I believe uh, all and remembers that and he was on the verge of crying uh, that like the uh, Moscow I started the war and uh, he will uh, defend the country while we know that he was uh, uh, in charge of the Russian um, kind of spy network in Kiev region. So I'm not um, commenting on that, but uh, I believe that uh, the fact that uh, on the 24th Russia already managed to enter the territory of Kherson and we need to know the specific people who allowed for that, starting with the head of Oblast administration and uh, also heads, leaders of law enforcement authorities. They did everything possible so that there was no resistance. I have no questions to the, no doubts about the civilians, but then it made it possible for them to reach Militopol, Berdyansk, and Mariupol, which is so tragic. And uh, we are already tired of raising those issues to Verkhovna um, Rada. We understand that um, there are no answers to those, but Ukraine needs to learn the lesson. And we start. We need to start this purification process from inside. And only then we can say that we become um, open to each other. While in, now, while in Rivna Oblast uh, they are defending the Russian Orthodox Church, that's shame, and I believe that that deserves punishment under the criminal code. Well, I believe that in one day or in even in nine months of the war, we can hardly get rid of that completely because that has been. Uh, penetrating into our life for centuries. But I believe that now it is the best time when this could be done. And now, Salemia, you are a member of the committee that mostly uh, comprises men. Is it a challenge for you? Just a couple of seconds 
to respond. You are right. We will never have that time. This is about collaborators, about culture, religion as well. But where someone in Kyiv is accused of uh, state prison or of state treason and then uh, uh, released uh, without going to pre-detention facility and then they just flee abroad or where a um, taxi driver in Mykolaiv, there is the same story where this person is just released and disappears. So I believe that this is about this network of kind of rubbing each other's backs and uh, but we should no longer allow for that because uh, the uh, bloodshed in 24th of February it is something that turns us towards values and dignity it must never happen so so in Kherson the head of uh, the regional administration should not be someone who fell under illustration so I believe this is like sadism sadistic attitude surreal I don't care about the uh, sex of those people if they are men or women that's not about that that's about joint efforts we are going to speak about gender equality we always go back to that issue but frankly speaking when they submit draft laws and we say women health professionals or service women do they have the right to travel abroad so if men cannot do that why does that depend on sex so well we see that the public is unhappy with that but still well understand that uh, the nation needs to do the service uh, for the country and when we arrive at the situation where after 18 years of age both boys and girls need to do their service will the society be ready for that is that sufficient level of gender equality or should we only speak about misrepresentation of women or should we look at the both sides and with all my respect for the specific features of women sometimes women when they want to they need to have the right to implement their wishes but where the boys say that they uh, spare women of uh, going to the uh, front line or some especially dangerous risky areas well that's reasonable because there is common sense and when you work in the Verkhovna Rada it's not so much about working with men because well even though it may be relevant especially in uh, dealing with service persons because for years uh, in the USSR this is how attitude to women was developed so we don't have Many members of the committee, I now look at Vadim, who is my colleague in the committee. So the other people, those who have been service persons for many years, well, that may be a challenge, but I have respect for them because they are at the front. Thank you very much. You know, you sound so strong. I am very thankful for your position. I'm thankful for you being an unrelentless fighter. We are all tired, but we have to be tireless until the victory. Thank you, Slamia, an MP who joined our conversation. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Mm, uh, Marcin, uh, director, director of the National Democratic Institute, to our discussion. You are in this flower bed, sort of. I think you feel very comfortable. How would you say the tasks and strategic goals of your institute changed during the war? Because this is a fight for democracy, and this war is against the very fundamentals, the very principles of um, the world. How does your institute f uh, feel right now? Dear friends, thank you very much. First, I would like to say that this is uh, the third Congress for me, but this one is a unique Congress, evidently, because, mm, well, first, let me uh, say a few words uh, on my own behalf. Thank you all. Uh, on behalf of our donors, US, Canada, Sweden, Sweden and UK, it's a great privilege and honor to be a partner with the Congress, especially in this unique moment. 
and I think it was already mentioned by a number of speakers. Um, I have no doubts, and I can tell you on behalf of NDI, my American colleagues, and also as a poll, you know, Ukraine is today the most important country in the world. And I can tell you this as a father of two sons, you are fighting not only for today, but also for the future of all of us. There will be no democratic, free, equal Europe without us winning this war. And we have to do our best, have to go extra mile to support Ukraine today. Um, and you know, let me also tell you that people might not realize it. Uh, it was mentioned today by a number of speakers, uh, fantastic, resilient, brave Ukrainian women, not only fighting on the front line, not only being involved in humanitarian aid, but those, those women who came to Poland in the first few weeks. And you might not realize it, that you helped us, Poles, to become better people. I never seen in my life such a solidarity. Uh, and it was thanks to you when we became united as a country and we really became better people. Um, you know, on behalf of the Polish people, I also want to thank you. Um, I think everyone understands, you know, that Europe is, needs to be, um, you know, in solidarity with Ukrainian women. We've been mentioning throughout the um, opening remarks. So you've asked about NDI, and you know, we, we have this tradition as NDI that we don't talk about ourselves, we talk about our partners. Um, because you know, our partners are the most important um, in this whole equilibrium. So you know, if you ask me, you know, the, the support which we've been giving to Equal Opportunities Caucus in Virchowa Rada, Equal Opportunity Caucuses uh, throughout Ukraine, hundreds of women leaders, NGOs, you could see some of them and, you know, um, being present in the room, uh, some of them providing equipment, clothes for Ukrainian women soldiers. Um, you know, those are the concrete examples of how we are supporting our partners. Um, and also, if I can take two, three minutes, you know, some things which I see should be discussed and will be discussed at this Congress, it was already mentioned it. You know, our recent public opinion poll shows that 72% of Ukrainians want to see women at the key leadership positions in the country. Women, when it comes to reconstruction, you know, um, reforms um, after we win this war, um, it's pretty clear that women cannot be just in the room. They cannot be just at the table. They have to be at the head of the table. And that's exactly you know, what we are trying to do, preparing women leaders. And my friends, my Ukrainian friends in Warsaw, taki meme ne poruta. And my friends in Poland said that a country of generators can never be defeated by a country of degenerates. I see uh, women in Ukraine as a generator of ideas, a, a driver of reconstruction. This is what Ukraine should look like after the war. Just keep in mind, you know, we have an amazing potential of knowledge and ideas in this room. And this would be another great contribution Ukrainian women can make to make Ukraine a better place. It's very pleasant that you want to see more women in key leadership roles in Ukraine. And you know, if we speak in more global terms, I think that if more women were leaders of countries, there would definitely be fewer wars in the world because uh, women are naturally inclined to maintain life. A woman cannot just take away life uh, by nature. But you know, I read a lot uh, now that given the war, uh, Ukraine has become a trigger, a catalyst of major change, political, um, geopolitical, even philosophical. Of course, change is not happening as fast as we would like. But they, there are major global shifts. Uh, not just in your institute as a citizen, but as a citizen of Poland, as a citizen of a country which helps Ukrainians and understands Ukrainians like no one else. Do you feel this shift, this te great tectonic change that is happening in Ukraine, in Europe, in the world? And what do you think it can lead to? Do you have optimistic forecasts? No, it is a, a, a big important question, so I'll be brief. I've been working in Ukraine since 99. 
um, you know, and many friends in the room know me uh, that my heart, a bigger part of it is Ukrainian than Polish right now. Uh, I've already seen enormous changes over those last 20 years, but I think obviously the war is a paradigm shift. And obviously we are talking about Ukraine 2.0. It would be a Ukraine which, in my personal opinion, has a chance to be a shining example for the whole Europe. Because, you know, the reforms which we are discussing under those conditions, unfortunately, in many European countries, we have a processes which are going backwards. So when it comes to gender equality, inclusiveness, again, if I can quote NDI public opinion poll, we've seen the highest ever level of tolerance towards inclusiveness, including LGBTI community. You know, you are a shining example that you can build a society which is really, truly equal and inclusive. And of course, there are going to be challenges, and we really have to make sure that women are at the high table, at the top of the table when it comes to reconstruction efforts. Still, there is some room to improvement when we look at the current setup, current, current institutions, definitely room to improvement. And another thing which I believe is very important is to recognize that freedom of speech and political pluralism and gender equality are going to be three fundamental freedoms which you have to keep in mind on your path to European Union. And I promise to myself and my friends that I will stay in Ukraine as long as Ukraine joins the European Union. And I don't want to be away from my family for too long. Thank you very much. It is indeed a chance for Europe to change and definitely change for the better. Thank you very much, Margin. And I am very thankful to you and to all your compatriots. We will probably be thankful to you for decades for your, all your support and help. Thank you. And we continue our panel. We don't speak about women's leadership enough, it seems. But today, uh, while our uh, subject is women, war is not quite a women's subject. But now we are going to speak with, uh, with a woman who will definitely object and say that in, uh, war is indeed um, Women subject. I would like to speak with Yana Zinkevich, the uh, commander of uh, Hospitaliers Battalion and an MP. Yana, I would like to ask you more about your battalion. How was it established? In many interviews, many stories, you say that what is unique about your battalion is that you are independent in the good sense of the word. You have uh, 300 uh, people, all kinds of staff. Uh, mm, Mechanical engineers, uh, drivers, etc. Where do you find them? How do you inspire them? Thank you. Indeed, I will probably start with the history of our establishment because it is interesting how I came up with this idea. As you may know, when the war started, I had just graduated from school. I was set to enter a medical university, and I had a dream that after I graduated from university, I would join the Red Cross and I would uh, uh, save people in areas of facilities. But nobody knew that war would come to Ukraine, and I would be able to put my skills to test within the country. First, I joined um, uh, the hostilities among the first in April, and they spent a while during the storm of various cities. And I saw that there were not enough people to take care of the dead, the wounded, of exchanges. And understanding this and feeling this initiative and also feeling uh, my youthful maximalism, I felt that I would be able to do something important. And that's how I became a paramedic and how I um, put together a small team of six people. I thought this would be uh, the highest level I would ever achieve, that we would do a lot of work as is, but it developed as you know it did. And uh, one evening we were in Biskiv village next to the Donetsk airport. There was strong shelling. We had just liberated this village. We had just maintained a stronghold and I felt that we wouldn't survive. And when another shelling started, 
everyone started running into free basements. I ran to one of the basements, and there were 20 people there, and there was a priest there. The priest started talking to people, supporting them, telling them various stories. And then he reached to the history of Templars. I am not uh, good at history, so I had not heard about this community before. And um, uh, before that, he shared a story about the uh, story of um, the order of hospitaliers who were rescuing knights. And I made my, a promise to myself that if I survived, I would establish an organization called Hospitaliers. And uh, that's how it started. Uh, gradually, we were growing, we were uh, uh, getting bigger. At first, it was difficult to recruit women because there was uh, too much. Uh, Hand holding on behalf of uh, men. So, Olena Bilozerska and I were the only two women in the organization at first. And only after half a year, I achieved the right to engage women on equal footing. Also, I want to say that it was very difficult at first because a woman had to earn the right to fight and to be on the front line. Women were not allowed there, women were protected, and a woman had to be 10 times as good as an average man in order to gain this right. And I was eventually able to convince people that I am capable, that I am independent, that I could be trusted as much as any man. Sorry. Today, are there many women hospitaliers? We had many women every year. Uh, there was a year when we had 60% of women. Now, due to the full-scale war, our battalion has quite a lot of people. I, I actually have uh, 500 people on rotations uh, now. That is 120 crews. We have over 250 reanimation vehicles, which we um, uh, constantly replaced because they are getting bombed, they are getting destroyed. So this is an endless conveyor belt. Uh, we lose six or seven vehicles a month. In addition, we have 70% of personnel who ensure our warehousing, our logistics, so they maintain the battalion's work overall. It is indeed a complex structure, and I'm very surprised that I am able to manage it. We are also surprised, and we are in awe of you. It is not a standard thing, because there are certain rules in the army, there are certain categories. In our organization, you don't have the same hierarchical structure. We have the uh, chief of staff, the chief of headquarters, and then there is me. I speak with every fighter personally. I have to remember everyone. I have to know everyone personally because, indeed, I send them on a task every day, and they may not come back. Unfortunately, we have people who died. We have um, people who have been captured. Um, we have had people who were... Um, Captured uh, and two were already liberated. Uh, these are Ptashka, the bird, and Borisovna. Uh, and there are more people in captivity whom we are really waiting for. Yana, who is helping you? This is a, an enormous machine that you have launched. Who is helping? Only volunteers or somebody else? You know, I have this sort of unique situation. Two categories where women have it hardest is politics and the front line. And somehow I am in both places at once. And this is quite exhausting. Now I indeed uh, don't focus as much on the parliamentary issues, although I do attend uh, uh, the meetings. I, I think the parliament will forgive you, won't it? Well, I still try to come there and to be present everywhere. I think it's probably just experience. It was hard during the first months back in 2014. There was hope that things would end quickly. But looking at the situation after the Balceva, I uh, fully understood that it would take a long time. It would be for at least 10 years that, it would, uh, that I was in deep. So I was uh, carrying this burden every year since because I understood that hospitaliers were my family. It's like my baby. 
that I raised, that I grew, and every fighter is my kitten. That's what we call them, especially the newcomers in the battalion. They all trust me. They trust me with their lives. They hope uh, for my support, so I c cannot help but be responsible for them. I have to do what I do every day. And of course, I don't have enough energy for this. I was so exhausted this year that I ended up in the ICU. But I still managed to recover and to continue my work. And I will do it still. Jana, thank you very much. We all support your work. Please don't uh, end up in the ICU anymore. Take care. We need you healthy. Thank you very much for your work. And I really hope you find more time for your family, because I know that your family is not with you now, and you don't communicate with them enough. And I really hope that there will be time when you see them more. Thank you. Well, my family was ready, and I was ready for the full-scale invasion. We were preparing for it for nine months since April last year. So my mom and my daughter left on the very uh, first day, and my uh, stepfather and my husband joined my battalion. Yeah, so we have sort of a family team there. Thank you very much. This was Jan Zinkevich. And next to me, we have Yulia Payevska Taira. Yulia, you know. I have so many questions I would like to ask you. I don't know where to start, but I will probably start with the simplest thing. When I read about you, when I saw you, I don't know how you uh, survived all of this, the captivity, the volunteer work. How did you manage it and how do you feel about it right now? I understand that these are very fresh memories. So can you hear me? So everything is working. I don't know how I went through this. I honestly don't know how to s what to say. I just felt that I was supported, I was waited for, prayed for, and I prayed for the whole country in return. All uh, my free time, which I had, that's what I did. And I was thinking about the future. So I was picturing the country that we are going to have, the which country we are going to build after we win. And of course we will win. It's like it's not if, it's when. And you know, when Mariupol was being destroyed with aviation and, uh, and shelling from the sea, I saw how the city was dying how buildings were being destroyed, just regular houses of regular people. And you know, it came to my mind that Mariupol, it was Soviet, Soviet building, most of buildings, they were built during the Soviet uh, Union time. And I had this picture in my mind that Russia is destroying what uh, could have united us, if you know what I mean. They are destroying connections which could have been restored at some point one day after a few generations. And we have a chance on these ruins, on this blood, on these tears, on this suffering to build a new country, absolutely new. I see a new country, not recovery of the old one, but completely new. In comparison to Russia, which takes us to the past, because everything that brings with them, that's hulag, that's torturing, imposing their will, and uh, then uh, capturing Ukraine and capturing Europe and the whole world, that's what they told me when I was captured. I don't know how I went through this. I just believe that it's going to be fine. And Ukraine will win as well. <laughs> Yulia, you're saying a lot that when the death is next to you, you feel 
the most this i i don't want to use this like taste of life but you you live not uh, 100% but 1000% of life maybe it's a naive and stupid question but you are very strong woman you were already so what made you even stronger what gave you power to survive except your faith and and what did you learn I think that uh, I I'm a psychologist like I keep analyzing what was happening what is happening to me now and I'm going through all the stages what else helped me sport physical exercise yoga just regular things uh, like uh, push-ups or and a lot of breathing exercise. So I constantly was uh, focusing on myself and uh, from martial arts. So you know that uh, I, uh, I'm good at Aikido and it helped me a lot. And I don't know how to explain that, but besides sports, also I had a feeling that I had a mission which I still need to fulfill. And for that, I will be freed. That's if I speak honestly. You did. Julia, I, I understand that the war really makes other things uh, unimportant, like that whether it's man or woman or like some standards. But can you compare yourself before the war, during the war and uh, after the captivity? Or are you the same, strong as ever? You know, I remember myself uh, since I was a little child and nothing really changes. Honestly, I, I want to say something. Yes, of course. We talk about leadership, right? About values, about uh, leaders. I want to offer Ukrainian Women's Congress. Sorry, I. S I want to to send this. I uh, want to uh, to send a request to the Red Cross. Did you write to them? Yeah. Let's let's do it exactly from Ukraine Women's Congress because uh, a lot of people from France or the United States they have lots of questions because. Uh, because about Notre Dame, where money disappeared there, but here we are not talking just about money, about lives of people, about torturing, and and uh, every day when you are captured is like a year, and I hope you will never be captured and know what it, how it feels. And also, I want to address the UN, the OSCE, the European Parliament, to create a group because the Red Cross doesn't work. They don't fulfill their functions. So to create the group which which will not help but which will get to the places uh, where our prisoners of war are held, to concentration camps, torture rooms, prisons where we are held where these places are without rule of law, no human rights, all uh, Geneva Conventions are violated, all of them. And I am sure that there are women here and men and women in this room who can do this. Because I'm not a professional in this area, will you help? Let's do it, let's do it together. Because we are strong, we are leaders. Thank you very much, Yulia. And also, I want to thank uh, my brothers and sisters in the front line. And uh, I, I, I want to tell those who are captured, even if they cannot hear me, and it is 
awful and painful, but it will be over. It will not be forever. And that's what kept me sane. And even though we honored the memory of those who have fallen, of our sisters that we lost, we lost many of them. And please just remember, let's not do this the whole minute, just remember about them. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yuli, and we will definitely win uh, if we have people like you. So it was Yulia Bayevska. Now we are move forward to Katarina Savcha, to my colleague, who I respect and love, and uh, I often saw her and admired her. It was unusual to see you in a different role, but it was logical. I want to ask you in the first place how you as a journalist, as a TV host, it was not easy to switch and to talk to a completely different group of people, people who are suffering, people who are in pain. It's not a glamour event or party. These are people who are crying rather than talk. And you needed to change. I, I understand that you're a smart and talented woman, but, but was it easy? Good morning, everyone. Actually, uh, look, looking for people who are missing and what we started to do with volunteers since March the 3rd, it didn't start as an interview. We started with Telegram channel just to help. F from the very first day of the war and until now, there is a very strong wish to help, help everywhere. And sometimes I stop, stop myself because I understand that I cannot do anything, but I, I'm trying to do as much as I can. So at first it, we were just trying to assist. So we needed to unite people. We needed to give them uh, one united platform where they could see the photos of people who were lost, uh, to, know, to give them contact information, to unite them. That's why we started. And then uh, the, this project became uh, to scale, and now we have a TV component. And you know well that the main principle of a journalist that's to hear what people say people who are looking for their members of their family uh, or people whose uh, members of family are captured because more than 2,000 uh, people who are captured are civilians. And uh, Tyra is saying that there are a lot more because we cannot count all of them. Uh, we are working uh, with uh, with. Uh, our intelligence and the SPU and uh, with uh, Ombudsman's office and uh, and uh, we are trying to calculate this number. So to listen and hear these people, that's the most important aspect. And now with this, uh, I use this journalist skill. I listen to people. I know what they need. People who are in this very difficult circumstances and uh, now we are working with uh, civilian uh, hostages because uh, that's uh, our biggest uh, issue. That's why we started work in Ombudsman's Office on Human Rights and uh, we started to work uh, and how to influence Red Cross and uh, which structure can actually get access uh, to prisons because this is a huge problem. And I understand as I, the person who uh, I have my audience and I know people. Yes, people can have different attitude to me. On the 23rd of February, I uh, took off my glamorous hat. And then on the 24th, I woke up as a different person. But uh, I understand that uh, if I persist, I visit offices, I talk about the problem because there are problems and I know that uh, missing persons became the issue when I started visiting different offices and I st started to say that uh, we need to do it now, that it is an issue, let's not let, let it go too far. 
Now there is uh, a lot of attention to looking for missing persons. And now we also need to pay uh, more attention to capture civilians. And I want to thank uh, uh, everyone. And yesterday, three civilian people, they were part of the exchange. And I'm really grateful to everyone who helped me. Katya, can you remember some example that m really made you tear up? And I understand that all uh, the stories that probably lead to tears, but can you come up with some example that you will never forget? Now I meet uh, personally. If we can meet uh, these people, if uh, it's possible. And uh, the day before yesterday, I visited a village. It's just 25 minutes from the center of Kiev. It's uh, right out near Bucha. And there was a woman. And uh, while they were under occupation, her husband and her son were taken by Russians. And she has been alone for nine months. She doesn't have anybody else. And she can only hope that they are captured, because she doesn't know where they are. Uh, bodies were not found. She just hopes that they still are, and they will come back. And a woman from Mariupol who, who was under shelling twice uh, in her house and then in a drama theater, her husband died, and she, we found her. She got out of the hell of Mariupol, and uh, she had this really real thirst for life. And I had to take this interview, even if we have to be professional and we shouldn't cry. But uh, and uh, she see, she looks into the future and she says everything's going to be fine. We will go back to Mariupol. Mariupol will be will be Ukrainian again and will rebuild the drama theater. So people who believe and see this light at the end of the tunnel, they inspire all of us, so all volunteers, all my big team. And that's more than 60 people now. And uh, we are all inspired and we hope that we'll find everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your work. And um, maybe it sounds a bit naive, but I hope uh, that uh, there will be a day when you put your hat uh, back on. I really hope that our volunteer work to be over. And so we, uh, that we, uh, I want us to find everyone, for everyone to come back from captivity. So, and uh, so that I can just visit different events and I can just host events like you are doing now. Thank you very much. And uh, we are finishing our panel. We are already a bit out of time, but all uh, men and women, we are saying that, of course, we will win. We will have enough energy for that. And uh, probably about the strategy of uh, post-war Ukraine, that's what I want to discuss. And I want to give the floor to Helena Savrok so that from Mohila Strategic Agency, managing partner. And uh, I saw you before only during some presentations. And I know that people who went through your course. So I will ask a simple question. So a lot of dreams were destroyed, people and strategies. But uh, a lot of new dreams are born and strategies are born. And uh, as you said, that uh, the future of Ukraine depends uh, on these uh, future dreams and strategies. So what are they for Ukraine after the victory? Thank you very much. It's a very simple and very difficult question at the same time. And today we talk a lot about leadership of women during the war. But right after the war, uh, we will have a completely different period. We don't discuss it enough. It will be as dangerous and difficult. And I'm sure we will go through that period with dignity. And leadership of women will be important as well. And if we look at uh, the key factor or key basis for this, which will allow us uh, to go this uh, period, that's the strength of our public institutions. 
and the role of leadership of women it's difficult to overestimate because 75 percent of women are public servants so whether the state uh, can bring our people back home uh, whether we can uh, restore our demographic capital whether our state uh, can reintegrate people whether we can uh, go through transformational justice so it depends on our public institutions and uh, also for me Olha Stefanishin uh, uh, example of our vice uh, Prime Minister, because our way to the EU, where which she leads, that's probably one of uh, the most important drivers of uh, our public institutions, because we need to follow the requirements of the European Union, and uh, it's a big challenge and help for us, and uh, the role of women is important here too. And uh, also what is going to be important for us, that's our society. What we've achieved this unprecedented level of unity. And I can say that uh, that's probably the highest level of unity of society. And that's what we can, we can be proud of. And unfortunately, aggressor, now they chose this as the main dimension of the war, and that's what they're going to attack after the war is over. So it's very important not to lose this unity and the role of uh, women in this unity on local, regional and uh, national level the, is very important because uh, women can take care of partners, of people around, and that's the core of this unity. But we cannot just uh, stop and uh, we need uh, to continue doing this and it's very important uh, for us uh, to to develop and build our nation is it possible that this this unity will be over it will be just exhausted after the war and uh, what can we do to prevent this from happening so that we have energy to build ukraine after Unity is probably is uh, the hardest, uh, uh, the most important asset for Ukraine, the most important asset. And that's what we need to keep restoring and supporting because, because uh, we talk about values here in this Congress and the strengths of society that's that's really a lot like it demands a lot uh, from international partners and uh, the state so we need to undergo this trial with dignity and uh, the rule of law this is another uh, call and challenge for us and uh, this uh, challenge to recover the society that's key and uh, um, united community society that's based on values and here it is important to recover the cultural memory the memory policy and of course there is a lot of demand high level of demand for justice bringing the russian federation to justice making them liable and uh, compliance with all the transitional justice requirements so that we not only punish the aggressor but so that the uh, people were brought were held accountable in ukraine united nations today announced the latest figure of ukrainian uh, refugees abroad uh, it is almost five million four million eight hundred thousand and as i mentioned at the beginning i'm concerned about uh, every woman every child because they are my sisters i want them to come back but a lot of people are apprehensive how shall we bring them back i understand that's a challenge but uh, i also understand there should be a national program because uh, i hear our officials uh, speaking they say don't hurry to come back on the one hand i understand it's cold here no electricity supply no nothing but i understand that every next day there is another increases the odds of their staying there 
Actually, I've just come back from a business trip today, and each time when I cross the border in Pramishal, uh, Pramishal, I see uh, the, our women with children, and uh, it was no exception yesterday. And of course, that gives me heart pain. Why are our people? Uh, why do they have to undergo this trial? Our beautiful women waiting with their children, waiting for passport control. It always gives me pain. And uh, I've been thinking about how to bring them back. And actually, this is about the capacity of the state, whether the state, the government develops the respective programs to recover the housing, to provide jobs for women. They will come back when it is safe. Above all, this is about peace, about guarantees of peace. And without that, nobody is coming back. And then what's next in the field of education? Of course, they will come back when they see that uh, their um, children will be um, able to attend school, so recovering their services, and of course, the economic programs that are being developed by the government, and I'm sure that they will be a success. Thank you. We also trust in that. And now we are going to wrap up. Thanks to all of our guests. Thank you for your optimism, for your openness, wiseness. Uh, and we will definitely prevail. Glory to Ukraine and glory to heroes. Пані Яну, я вас рада вітати. Вітаю. Ну, без перебільшення, будь-який наш глядач, він 100% є споживачем вашої продукції, тому що всі дивляться канали, які входять до вашої медіагрупи. Але ми пам'ятаємо телебачення. So we remember uh, the television before 24th of February. So what are the standards and the main ideas that you are promoting now in the context of the full-fledged aggression? Above all, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be here at the Congress today. That's a, an important point of reliance for women's leadership in the situation of the war. So I'm grateful that this event is taking place. Before the 24th of February, the television was about entertainment, about uh, dreams about, and also above all um, about diversity of those dreams since the 24th of february uh, the entire country has one key dream and this is definitely no longer that much about diversity but that's about uh, in uh, about unity and uh, in the morning on the 24th of february it was important to demonstrate this unity to the entire country including in the information front line for me personally as an employee of the media group uh, or broadcaster on the 24th of February, the Ukrainian television was about resilience of those people who develop who television, the uh, editors and uh, managers of uh, television started media. By the way, all the uh, directors there are a female. So it is about resilience of yours, uh, um, of journalists. Uh, 
uh, where you are ready to be with the country, even though we understand that you have your own families and definitely you were concerned about yourselves and your family. So today I would like to say words of gratitude to all the media people who on the 24th of February made that important choice to be next to the um, audience. And uh, even when we have this black out a shutdown situation, uh, the television is ongoing. So definitely it is about unity. Let me emphasize for our audience that actually all journalists, media representatives on the 24th of February, they faced a very specific question. Should they rescue themselves or rescue their country? And I know a lot of employees of Starlight Media who 24-7 continued working. And I also remember that I have a lot of colleagues uh, who work in ICTV, for example, and I remember that since uh, the times of uh, uh, Revolution of Dignity, they were first ones to be present in Maidan. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of occupied settlements and uh, the front line is much wider. So is it about that we will not send girls there, women, uh, like camera women or uh, journalists, if they want to go there, you do you let them go? Yes, of course, for starlight media, uh, gender equality is an absolute value. And of course, uh, this is uh, about stormy time, but this is not the time where we would uh, um, step back from our values. And you're right that we have always had wide representation of women, and I'm happy with that. And before the war, we had the internal audit where we would check representation of uh, women at all levels. And now we have the same attitude to the guests um, who we broadcast on ICTV. And definitely in-house, in managing the company and in content development, women are have equal role and equal responsibility. And at the level of our leadership of top management, we can see this gender balance at the level of our journalist teams and uh, anchor teams. Definitely, we see that uh, women in these positions in at the regional level and when they cover um, security and defense issues, women play an important role at this information front line where they cover the information and where they share with the Ukrainians those stories about um, heroes and heroines. Uh, what about the content. It is important since the 24th of uh, February, because previously we had a lot of compromises about languages, about themes or actors who were invited to um, to star or to be members of the jury. So what will never happen now? Is it possible that we will hear a Russian-speaking expert on um, channels of starlight media, or is it no longer time for compromise? No microphone, no sound. No sound for the interpreters. Sorry. No sound, sorry. It's no secret that Starlight Media and any Ukrainian channel needs to be a business. It needs to generate profit. It needs to be a success. How to do that in the context of the war? I don't know. People who manage to do that, they are like heroes because they do not give up. And uh, this is about Starlight Media as well. And I'm sure that maybe you had these ideas that it may close down, shut down, even though you're 
history is outstanding. Do you manage to balance now during the war? And uh, do you, well, it's so cool that you are there because it is about jobs, it is about keeping the audience informed, this is about uh, unity, uh, cohesion. So the mission is much higher than before the 24th of February. Yes, definitely, the mission is now more extensive. I remember on the 24th of February, we discussed that with the team, Starlet Media addressed the team, and there were two messages about the value of safety of every employee, and another one was about that we are with the country and we will stay uh, next to every Ukrainian until the victory. Definitely, and definitely this is one of the greatest challenges um, for the Ukrainian media. But we continue working on the daily basis to recover the advertising market. And there, there is a high representation of women creators, marketologists who continue doing that, working on that. We also develop digital formats and new content. And you know, I remember this spring when it was not possible to create new content for safety and financial reasons. And I could see how our creators just took their cell phones and uh, developed new formats. And the television continued, uh, went on, because definitely it was about informing and supporting unity. And that's the emotional. Uh, point of reliance. And I understand that now Ukrainian media are definitely implementing this mission 100%. And I believe that every media person has an understanding of the greater and even greater mission and responsibility to the society. It was so nice and unusual to find out that you monitor gender equality even in the context of the war. How many girls and uh, women experts are now on air. Yes, I believe that this monitoring is so important. Starlight Media is implementing monitoring of representation of uh, female experts in the quarter of uh, the National Marathon. United News, that was the initiative of Alexander Bohutsky, our CEO. We do that on a monthly basis, and we definitely know the general figures for women representation and by categories. I'd like to say that this is 50 to 50, not yet, unfortunately, but we keep working on that. And I know that uh, we have the highest uh, index, which is about 30 percent. This is for our broadcaster. And we have good indicators in the category of MP women, uh, uh, human rights activists, international organizations, volunteers. And we are now working to increase representation of uh, expert, uh, uh, of female experts in the security and defense category. And I believe that while we develop our collaboration with uh, uh, NGOs, we will reach this goal. Thank you for this discussion. And of course, we wish to you, to your media group, that you have only good news and let's have more of them. Thank you.
Так. Well, I don't know how I should force people to sit down properly, but we should start. We are starting the second panel at Ukrainian Women's Congress. And the subject that we are going to discuss is very close to me personally, and I believe that women's participation in economic processes is key, not just because women are primarily responsible for the family, for all budgets, for all kinds of purchases. It is women who make decisions, at least in Ukraine. We are not Russia, thankfully. But we also need to understand that women play a key role in the formation of trust. We are speaking about values here. So as a person who works in communications, I think that trust is one of the key values that we have. And just a couple days ago, I had a session in Lviv Business School where I taught strategic communication. And we spoke about how Mm, differently we treat trust today. And looking at the recent research, I see how important it is that at this time people should trust each other, understand what is happening with their finances, that they should trust institutions, which was uh, what the previous panel was about, and how important it is to them that they should believe they have hope and a future to come back home to rebuild, although Tyra said it will not be rebuilding, it will be building a new country, maybe she is right. And today, we are here today, and I want to introduce our participants of the panel. And I am very thankful that despite the difficult time, um, you found the um, time to join us. We will have Yulis Ferdenko, uh, who will join us online, first Deputy Minister of Prime Minister and Minister of Economy of Ukraine, uh, Oksana Zolnovich, Minister of Social Policy, Lena Shulyak, Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Thank you also for uh, joining us. Ina Skarzynska, founder of Sna Brand. Thank you. I know your brand myself. Man Hrishchuk, uh, Ukrainian Member of Parliament, Taras Kremlin, Commissioner for the Protection of the State Language. Hello. And Larissa Zahun, Head of of the media education cluster in Poland. I think this is the most difficult to, uh, thing to do, something great in Poland. Now I lived there for mm, a few years, so I know what I'm talking about. I guess we'll start with the video address. Can we do that? Let's do that. Dear participants, welcome to Ukrainian Women's Congress. It is taking place at a very difficult time for Ukraine, and it is a very difficult time for every Ukrainian woman, wife, sister, mother, daughter. The war affects primarily the most vulnerable, children, the elderly. Thousands of Ukrainian families have been left without accommodation today because it has been destroyed by the terrorist state. Millions of Ukrainian women were forced to leave Ukraine. According to the uh, UNHCR, almost 5 million of Ukrainians officially received temporary protection in Europe as of November. Most of them are women with children. They are mothers who rescued their children from the war. Those who left their home had to get used to a new uh, environment, to learn a new language, find a job and take care of their family. And we have to start creating conditions for their return. This means restoring housing and providing housing to those who lost it, restore infrastructure, including schools, kindergarten, maternity hospitals, regular hospitals. Although the war is still ongoing, we are working on this. The program for support of uh, uh, business of unemployed people is already un underway. Alina Lane was the, one of the first clients of the micro-grant program. In September, she launched a pizza place, and she employs young people with Down syndrome. Every day, they bake social bread, which they give away to people. This baker has become very popular among the youth, and there are uh, lots of similar stories. Over 40% of recipients of our micro-grants are women. Thousands of women have undergone the requalification program of the State Employment Agency and have obtained a new profession. Multiple small businesses were opened by 
women during the war, which is were 40,000 of uh, private entrepreneurs. It is difficult for Ukrainian women now. It will be also difficult after our victory. But the government is taking care to rebuild Ukraine starting today. And with such strong, intelligent women, we can do everything. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much. It is wonderful, and I understand it's highly important when programs start working. I guess we need to speak about them more and explain how they work, because it is very difficult for people sometimes to even start joining these programs, because not everyone understands their details. But I guess uh, following up on the uh, subject uh, Julia already said about the challenge that we are going to work with. My closest friend has uh, now engaged in building rehabilitation centers for people with disabilities in Lviv. It's called Superhumans. And her purpose is not to build the hub, the center now, as she says, but to change the attitude to people who will come back after the war. It is not just uh, the military, but also civilians. So we are saying that it will take us 10 to 15 years to defuse all the mines in the country. How do we adapt to them? How do we look for jobs for them? How do we ensure that they don't become outcasts like they were in the USSR and instead become heroes for our country? Uh, Oksana, can you tell us how the government is going to handle this? Thank you for the opportunity to speak. You are indeed uh, correct in saying that everything that is happening now will completely change our lives tomorrow. And we have to be ready for this today. And if we are speaking about inclusion, about accessibility, about uh, our society facing a greater number of people with disabilities very soon. This is reality, and we have to calculate this reality already. And we have to uh, make sure to build trust, trust that these people should feel since the first day of this trauma. They need to understand that there is a future, that everything is possible, that mm, the, their trauma is not a sentence to them. It is. Uh, Mm, still manageable. And now I want to tell all the men and women who are under the risk of a trauma today that no trauma is end-all mm, uh, be-all. Every trauma uh, ca is something that you can adapt to. And this confidence allows you to overcome anything. What are we doing for this? We have already registered a new draft law, which provides for completely different approaches to work with people with disabilities. Like ministers uh, here said, uh, she, she spoke about a private entrepreneur who created a social enterprise employing people with Down syndrome. Unfortunately, today's conditions, this social enterprise cannot receive any support from the government because the legislation is constructed in such a way that first you need to establish an NGO, then mm, this NGO establishes an enterprise, and only then can you count on something. This is absurd. In our draft law, we suggest that when anyone develops their business mm, in a way that they understand this business can become social, they can uh, receive government support. We want to extend the network of social enterprises. We want to provide support to entrepreneurs because we understand that not everyone can become a social entrepreneur from the start. First, you need to uh, make your money back. You need to break even at least uh, and maybe receive marginal profits in what you are doing. And this is something that is um, that opens up the next stage in the development of of our social enterprises. And this can also help to provide jobs to people with disabilities, because I think there is a need for a comprehensive approach to adaptation of people with disabilities. And the most important component of this adaptation is their economic uh, um, opportunities. I think people with disabilities don't need help um, uh, per se. But and considering the way that Ukraine's economy is working, the, the financial help cannot be great. I always say that for a person to receive 10,000 uh, hryvnias in pension, somebody has to pay that amount every single cent out of it. It's all paid from our taxes. So we need to move away from this philosophy.
and almost every person should have an opportunity to be economically active and employed. This is our new philosophy that we are trying to use to go into uh, the future. Also, 5 million of women with children who are currently abroad, they have found a place there. They have found a place for their children. And very often they have been able to obtain services they were never able to obtain in Ukraine, especially if they have children with disabilities. I know that the mom always wants the best for her child. And even if she misses her home very much, if she understands that services for her child will be better abroad, she will choose the place that is better for her child. So we are already thinking how to restore social services, how to develop social services the way they are developed worldwide, so that every mother should have an opportunity to choose to come back freely and to show that uh, she can obtain the same service back home, that she, um, she can become an entity providing such services. Worldwide, there are NGOs providing social services, private entrepreneurs providing social services. This is a business. So socially active, socially targeted businesses are social services. And we are currently working on developing a procurement mechanism. Uh, we want to propose it to communities, to the government, so that people who are now engaged in community work, and volunteer work, who want to do something important can put their initiative to good use. In the previous panel I heard and I fully supported that we now have a lot of cohesion, a lot of inspiration, and this cohesion is built on volunteer work. And those who try to do volunteer work, they know that it feels very rewarding because you do something good, something useful. This is your emotional doping. And later you cannot give up this doping you will keep seeking it you will keep trying to help somebody it's very important not to lose this wave but to ride it after the war we'll have a lot of focus areas when i did an internship in the us it was a big discovery for me that um, people who do volunteer work some of them just come to a rehabilitation center just to hang out with people who are there just to bring them coffee and talk and they uh, do a lot a lot of work for those uh, nurses and other staff working there and this is another vector of policy that I am confident we are going to develop this was very brief I don't want to take away time from others I think this is something highly important. I work in one of the biggest state banks. I work in Privat Bank, which has um, 20,000 employees, and these uh, four quotas are very difficult. How do we adapt them? How do we help them? How do we convince some leaders in our bank, in a state bank, to employ them? For example, we have some formal requirements to our subsidiaries, but they are very formal. They need to change, I guess, because there are going to be people who are not just wheelchair users, but also people after a brain trauma or something like that. There are several barriers here. One, it is the a person with a disability who is scared of coming to work, and then there is a team scared of receiving them. What if a person has a nervous breakdown? What if a person has mm, an epilepsy attack? Mm. So our project also involves support in the workplace as a mandatory element of employment of persons with disabilities. What does it mean? It means that specially trained people provide a social service, and the service involves not just training of the uh, person with a disability, but also training of the team. When somebody comes in and says, it's not scary, if this happens, turn off the light, mm. Uh, turn the person to the side and so on. When a person knows what can happen, what cannot happen, how it progresses, these barriers are all removed. When there is an ergotherapist who can say uh, the bathroom has to be like this, support has to be like this, this simplifies the entrepreneur's life. We have to support this service, we have to help everyone to be adapted to each other because this will eventually make our society stronger. 
when is, sh is this law going to be adopted? It is on the agenda on the 1st of December. I urge all MPs present here and others to support it in the first reading. Then, of course, we will finalize it with all the proposed amendments, and I hope that next year it will be fully adopted and we will start implementing it. I wanted to say that we are introducing um, courses on changing the culture so we can share experience later. Um, Alana, could you tell us? Uh, we need to understand that our future will be largely dependent on local communities, really largely. The culture of communities is very organic to Ukraine. And what should we do? We are a parliamentary presidential republic, and the parliament is the strongest institution. What are we going to do? in this context to support development on site? How do we address those challenges? Indeed, during the war, women have shown their best leadership qualities, their best organizational skills. And we see that it is not important uh, where women uh, are or what they are doing, whether they are in Europe saving children or whether they are in Ukraine, women have always found various effective mechanisms to try and achieve the goal they set. I would like to uh, focus um, on the new electoral legislation that we passed uh, back in 2020, and the quota constituted 40% in local elections. I hope this quota will remain after the next elections and we will see 40% of women in the parliament as well, which we can analyze after the local elections that have already taken place. Speaking about city councils, the previous share was 20% um, and uh, now the quota is 31 percent. At oblast level, f it increased from 15 percent to 28 percent. The representation of women in various levels of local councils has actually increased. I have recently visited Chernobyl oblast, and I was also curious to see what was happening there with the representation of women in the oblast council, because Chernobyl oblast is uh, traditionally not high representative of women. There were a few women among local councillors and so on. And indeed, local elections changed the share of women from 9% to 27%. And that was representation at the local level. And I would really like uh, this trend to continue. But as parliament, we need to take into account certain mistakes that were made during local elections, because there are some interesting numbers. For instance, 63% of rejections, that is when candidates refused to represent their community in uh, the uh, uh, local councils. Uh, what does this mean? This is evidence that women were used to beat purely technical candidates and then they gave up their seats. Uh, my, my doctor actually gave up a seat like that. She said she was asked to, to go and then she didn't want it. I hope we will have safeguards to prevent this in the future. And according to statistics to village and small town councils, even though the quota was um, increased there, the representation of women decreased. But I think after our victory, the voice of women will be much stronger than it was at the local elections. And to achieve this, we need to work at various levels. I see representatives of NDI Ukraine here in the room. They are our partners. And recently they held a big forum about women's wing in Ternopil Oblast. And you know, 120 women approved a resolution to uh, file an official address with central bodies of executive power, 
with a request to ensure the participation of women at at least 50 percent in all recovery processes, even if they are public councils or various advisory agencies. But women do see themselves as playing a major role in the recovery processes, and not because women are special, but because they have their own women's point of view about how these processes need to take place. Uh, so let's remember that uh, mostly women, uh, they uh, use uh, the social and uh, the services and they know uh, what should be changed and improved so that the country is uh, uh, rebuilt uh, by the new rules. And also we expect that those women who come back from Europe and uh, they already have experience, they see how it works in the European Union, they also, after they come back, after the victory, they can share their expertise in so that we rebuild the country by the new rules. And the person who spent half a year in Poland, I can say that when I come back uh, home, virtually everything is much easier in Ukraine. Sorry, Poland, but uh, some processes uh, are easy, uh, organized in an easier way. But uh, also I would like uh, to ask a very important aspect, laws. Laws about uh, supporting of enterprises uh, uh, for inter uh, if entrepreneurs lo lose their venue and they need some additional support is it planned when are there any intentions uh, in because this support of state uh, it uh, it brings back the trust to parliament and the state overall i think so being employed and have enough home, these are two very important things for Ukrainians. If we can provide these two things, uh, Ukrainians are very happy. And uh, now the state is doing everything possible for those businesses uh, which are staying in Ukraine. They create uh, workplaces, they are heroes, and the uh, state is trying to support them. Of course, uh, we have some area for improvement. In but uh, what to do with uh, destroyed uh, houses? We know that reparation process can take uh, years. Uh, it can take a, a lot of time. And uh, now the Ministry of Digital Transformation, uh, they launched in March uh, for citizens who have damaged or destroyed uh, houses uh, to send uh, messages through DIA app. Uh, more than 300,000 people use this uh, channel and uh, they input the information. It's uh, more than 21 million of damaged or destroyed uh, houses. Unfortunately, every year it was about like uh, 10 or 11 million. Uh, like we uh, had like new uh, housing and uh, Russia destroyed it, what we built. Uh, and we understand that is this uh, 21 uh, square a million square meters, uh, that's uh, not uh, the final number, and there will be more of them. And now in Parliament, uh, so the draft law is being prepared in Parliament and prepared for a second reading. So there is uh, a law on compensation for damage or destroyed housing. It's very important for us uh, to to uh, to give it for destroyed housing because that's a lot uh, more money and it's a lot more complicated. So all these informational messages that citizens shared uh, through DIA, they will be verified by local authorities and they will be included in the registry of uh, damage or destroyed property. And now people who don't have uh, houses anymore because it was completely destroyed, they will be able to get uh, this uh, kind of housing certificate. Uh, this is uh, the certificate for a certain amount of money, uh, which uh, they can uh, exchange it for square meters. And the person can uh, choose uh, the municipality where they want to live. Because we understand that uh, thousands of enterprises are uh, relocated and as we say that uh, for many people like uh, being employed is important and maybe they want to change the place where they live because they will want to be connected uh, to the place where they work. Uh, also, they can choose whether they want a house or an apartment. Uh, so for us, it's very important to introduce a transparent uh, mechanism and uh, for the sum of this uh, compensation should be fair and uh, competitive because uh, 
Of course, when we don't have enough money, uh, there can be some tricks used. And in Parliament, we will do everything possible to have parliamentary control for, for when uh, the cabinet ministers say she introduced this uh, uh, certain range or scale uh, for square meter. So we hope that they will they will do uh, that in a just way. And I think this initiative is very important uh, and uh, because uh, sometimes we hear that it takes us too long uh, to uh, adopt this law, but we were very um, scared uh, about uh, like to introduce it for the second reading if we didn't know the sources of the money where they will come from and of course uh, we can adopt any beautiful wonderful law that will not work now in parliament uh, we have the law about creating a fund of liquidation of uh, the consequences of uh, the russian aggression and now uh, uh, 13.9 billion hryvnias uh, confiscated from uh, the Russian spare bank. Uh, the, uh, this money will go to this fund. And then uh, we approved this with the Minister of Finance that this money is going to be used for compen compensating uh, the, uh, of this destroyed, uh, damaged housing. And uh, we hope that uh, if our international partners see that we have very clear, transparent mechanism using digital tools uh, through the uh, uh, how uh, local uh, authorities are engaged in this process about verification and other aspects. So I'm sure that our international partners uh, will join in uh, to bring more funds uh, for Ukrainians to have homes. Thank you very much. I understand that uh, we still need to hurry up because I checked the statistics of the World Bank that we need to start the restore now because now the roof uh, costs uh, 5,000 uh, uh, and then uh, it will be 20. So if we don't repair the roof, then we will need to destroy, uh, to restore the whole building. And I know you need to leave. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Ms. Olena and Oksana, they need to leave for the next forum because we're a bit behind uh, in our schedule. So thank you very much and have a nice event. And maybe our other speakers can move closer if you don't mind. Just sit closer to me because uh, I don't want to be surrounded by empty chairs. And uh, I would like to continue. I understand that uh, economy, any economy, now I uh, study macroeconomics and uh, and uh, Yaroslav Pretul, who is my wonderful professor, says that uh, there are many beautiful theories, but you need to understand that if there is no trust, if there is no human factors, economy doesn't work. If you don't have this entrepreneurial spirit, if you don't believe in the bright future tomorrow, if uh, you don't have this feeling that you can feel good in the place where you live, laws will not work. So let's go back and uh, let's talk to Mr. Roman on what we should do so that we can be sure that our children will have good education because I have two kids and I need to know that my kids uh, will have kindergarten with a bomb shelter. Also, I need to understand what to expect. And uh, I spent uh, half a year uh, in Poland. We have better kindergarten, we have better teachers, maybe because it's a language issue. But uh, we have a different attitude, different approaches. So, Mr. Rahman, what do you think? What should we do? And what are our plans? Uh, hello, everyone. I would like to say a few things. Uh, first, like a year ago, uh, during the Congress, in very narrow format, we discussed uh, also opportunities of uh, that uh, we, we never use the word uh, like full scale, but what we talk about, what about mobilization? What about it uh, becomes more dangerous? And uh, we had a discussion that women uh, will work on uh, this economic issues. And uh, we didn't discuss uh, the possibility of 5 million uh, refugees. We didn't discuss that on the 24th of February, every woman with a child will have uh, to ask themselves, uh, Am I a mother or am I a public servant? Should I stay or should I leave? Am I a mother or am I a principal? Uh, or am I a mother or am I a teacher? 
and every woman had to make this choice and I'm sure that every woman uh, felt bad about whatever choice they made so Yana Baron she took uh, a child and she was fired that's one of the cases and uh, we don't we uh, adopt, adopted the law about uh, education that it was uh, prohibited to fire uh, teachers who, who go abroad and we need to find mechanism how we can find the balance if the teacher is there abroad with kids still so uh, but we need to have educational uh, processes here we need to find the answers here in ukraine but uh, traditionally i talk about men during Women's Congress, and I think it's correct because we need to have balance, especially when we talk about education. I am a member of Educational Committee, and uh, that's uh, the area where women leaders, that's like the maximum of women leaders there. And uh, since the full-scale uh, invasion, so we know that uh, we have uh, this uh, a kind of uh, mechanism uh, not to recruit uh, teachers, but uh, many teachers, uh, they volunteered uh, to fight. And uh, mostly these were uh, teachers who were teaching how of protecting the motherland uh, subject. And uh, now we have even more women. Uh, if we talk about percentage of uh, uh, women and men in uh, school education and also there was a meeting of subcommittee and we discussed this article 23 about uh, the preschool and informal education so and we discussed about uh, those men who stayed uh, to teach I think there should be balance and there should be men and women who are teaching them and working with them. If we talk about the educational system, basically the system of education is destroyed. And we are not talking only about physical damage or dis destruction of buildings of houses. Yeah, we found the balance of online, but now uh, we don't have electricity and we, we don't use uh, online as a silver bullet. So, how, how teachers uh, need to work with uh, kids who went through the war. So that's a new challenge. How to teach to kids from uh, temporarily occupied territories, uh, IDP children, how to talk uh, to children whose parents died or fighting. So how to talk to a child whose father came back from the front line and uh, uh, came back with disabilities or other issues. And this all on the shoulders of women who also have their own personal problems. And if I go back to the protection of uh, Ukraine and now if we talk about the subject about uh, the protecting the motherland, I think that actually the person who protected the motherland had to be a teacher. Those uh, who who uh, got disabilities, we need to train them, educate them to teach at schools. It would be right for this man who need uh, employment. It is correct for women who are in systems. It is correct for the subject when we talk about defending the motherland. And uh, also children need to grow up uh, surrounded by these people to understand that it's normal. They are part of our life. They are heroes. And uh, it is normal uh, to use a wheelchair or to have prosthesis because uh, these heroes protected our motherland. If we talk about uh, restoring schools, yeah, of course we should not restore just like old-fashioned Soviet schools. We understand that school is the center of any community. The center which uh, is school one day, uh, the bomb shelter for other day, and uh, not only for uh, those people who are in school, but for local community. And also it can be a place where people can uh, warm up and uh, find some shelter from. So we need to step away from this Soviet paradigm of what school is, and school has to be multifunctional because we already have this negative experience, and this negative experience uh, has to be part of our thinking process and not to restore how it used to be. Also, I want to talk about education for adults. That's uh, what we discussed uh, 
uh, we are going to actually to discuss it after this meeting, so we all need to study. Because uh, life learn, uh, learning, that is the concept that that's where we're going to. And now, uh, during the war, when a lot of men and women come back uh, after the war and they cannot uh, find the job in the area where, where they worked before, they will need to retrain. Also, the compensation for losing the access to education. So we need to compensate this with this life learn learning because the kids who are studying now, they don't get this uh, high quality education which we had uh, when we just had normal school process. And so we need to keep learning and our kids need to keep learning. So we need to have this basic uh, conditions uh, for everyone to study, for children and adults. So that's where we are aiming at. And that's we are going to have legal framework for that, uh, for education for adults. And uh, it will be a good mechanism for combatants uh, to come back to normal life and also to compensate uh, those educational gaps uh, that our children have now. And now if we continue on the topic of education, we understand that education is our value. It's a very important value because it builds our future. Because if you have life learning process and uh, if we keep talking about education, I uh, hope that our war will close this door to the issue of language. And uh, I grew up in Kiev, and I was uh, constantly told that uh, uh, I was from the village because I spoke Ukrainian in Kiev. So what are we doing to close the store? And we understand that the hate uh, to the enemy will stay because uh, it's because our generation will survive. Uh, we are we are going to talk about this. It's not like uh, the famine of the 30s, so that when the, that generation basically died, but. Uh, but uh, we need to think about the value of language, how not to get into this trap uh, that, uh, that when Russians are saying that the, the language doesn't matter. So what are your plans? Uh, what is your vision? I understand that uh, Ukrainian business is going to be Ukrainian business, that, uh, that we don't need to fight to read a website in Ukrainian. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizer of this Congress. This is my first experience. Uh, I, even though it was uh, started six years ago, which is a wonderful uh, initiative uh, of uh, the MPs of the Eighth Convocation. To preserve the language, we need to speak it and not, not to turn it into politics, uh, fights, uh, where to speak, who we talk to. and. And uh, I don't have to speak certain language, and I, I have the right to speak any language. I think the factor of language is the key and basic point. And I think uh, the August 24, 1991, not the 24th of February of 2022, closed those doors. I studied in, in a regular Mikolaev school. Uh, uh, we used Russian as a language of education. Ukraine was in zero. I was in so-called uh, Russian environment where my uh, family uh, heard different slurs because uh, my father is from uh, Zakarpate and who is Ukrainian speaker f based on his beliefs and place of birth. But the factor of war influenced everyone and here we don't need laws and uh, maybe the almost personal protecting the language that will be some institution and in uh, participating in uh, by in conferences uh, or places where some politicians or uh, some mayors or some public servants they actually raise this issue and it will be just a part of history and uh, and so when we talk about uh, sanctions, about strengthening local communities and looking for resources uh, to, to convince our people, 5 million people to come back to Ukraine, because we will need to restore those schools, we will need to restore those hospitals, and we will need to train and to learn 
and to support and to show how we need to live our life. On the 24th, uh, many of our employees, they uh, volunteer to, to fight, uh, but uh, I stayed in, in Kiev in territorial defense, and my family left uh, my uh, uh, Mykolaiv, uh, my uh, motherland. But I knew that Mykolaiv will stand, and uh, I uh, remember really well that uh, Mykolaiv, regardless of age, uh, uh, their origin, education, they manage uh, to fight and uh, protect the south of the country. So this year for us, for the Secretariat, was a special year, mostly there are women working at the Secretariat. Uh, there's are heads of departments and units and our representatives in the southern part of Ukraine who on a daily basis, step after step, uh, step by step, uh, and uh, um, representatives of uh, local authorities, they contacted them trying to implement the uh, respective curricula to prevent uh, violation of human rights and uh, um, monitoring the social media and interpretation of the language law. But uh, actually, we started doing something that we should have done much earlier than on the 24th of uh, February, more than 350 uh, free of charge language uh, training courses, classes. Uh, this is uh, what is done by volunteers, by librarians, teachers, those people who uh, also work as uh, have the status of IDPs. And now I checked that uh, uh, language classes initiated by Donetsk residents, uh, postgraduate institute uh, training uh, classes uh, and training cl uh, courses, uh, language training from Luhansk. They're still functional and uh, Luhansk. Uh, uh, and the uh, Kherson Kanchara uh, library classes, they are also quite popular, especially after liberation. We work hard in order to enhance the role of uh, the official language at educational facilities. And I'm so happy that now very few people have doubts about that the role of language in the educational process in preschool and school and uh, university training, even if there are um, international students, that the official language is Ukrainian, of course. And this is not about punitive approach. This is about enhancing and protecting rights of our citizens. And these are also school curricula for foreign literature, because uh, uh, actually, pr prior to the war, 50% of the books uh, read were mm, those by Russian writers, uh, and uh, we still have a significant share of that. And uh, but, and I believe that you need to move faster there because we need to get rid of that narrative of the Russian uh, literature because it's like. Uh, a tick that you cannot get rid of. Well, actually, what's left, it's mostly formal now. But I believe that in the situation of the war, it is important to uh, enforce uh, certain provisions because uh, the 16th of July for us, that was the date when uh, we adopted the provision that uh, enhanced uh, the Ukrainian on the internet. Internet messengers, uh, uh, the broadcasts in public uh, facilities, and also that regulates fines. Are there any fine sanctions? Because I see that some of our competitors, they are high based on the Ukrainian language. Like we introduce, we have introduced the Ukrainian language. Like now everybody needs to praise them because all of a sudden in August, they decided that their website needs to be also available in Ukrainian. So how to implement that so that businesses could use that? Amendments to the Code of Administration offenses of Ukraine stipulates that uh, uh, warnings or fines can be applied as sanctions. Of course, we try to explain, to repeat many times, is it possible to apply sanctions immediately? Well, it's possible, I guess. It's like with Lavra situation and that we keep waiting and waiting. Maybe we should come up with sanctions immediately. Compared to last year, if you check statistics now, at least 80%, I believe, 
of Ukrainian citizens would say that the Ukrainian is the uh, native language, the Ukrainian language. They communicate, uh, they speak Ukrainian in their everyday life in church as well, and they request that other people speak, uh, use the official language. Uh, so this is about the concept of uh, uh, unity and protecting the information field, cultural diplomacy, language diplomacy, and with the Ukrainian language, well, our international partners address us, and uh, we. Uh, so, uh, Ukrainian language is becoming more popular. So, my task, uh, as that of the ombudsperson, is to comply with the law and to make sure that the Ukrainian language is. Uh, uh, oh, that uh, it is uh, acceptable uh, that it is used where our kids are studying so that our uh, citizens could uh, undergo nostrification process and uh, so that they could teach. And uh, of course, that will make sure that the Ukrainian language is back in our hearts and in our uh, space and in facilities. Uh, speaking about that, it's difficult for us to be uh, Broad, frankly speaking, in Poland there were so many Russian-speaking uh, children that my kids had to fight. Okay, I will not go into detail there. But uh, my question goes to Larissa. I cannot be very polite because my children are in MRD uh, preschool in Lviv, so I'm biased. But now you have managed to launch the cluster of Ukrainian schools in Poland. What were the challenges there? What were the plans and strategic objectives? Well, we understand that there is high need because in Poland now there are about two million Ukrainians. One million, even before the war, there was one million in Poland in Warsaw and all over Poland, plus uh, about 2.5 million now. So all in all, in Poland there are about four million Ukrainians in Poland. Wow. Then what are the plans and how are we going to move on uh, to a uh, steel? retaining this uh, possibility for them to come back. Let's start with challenges, because in March I moved to Poland and I was I directly was involved into developing educational services for uh, um, Ukrainian children. So it's a challenge in Poland regarding U education for Ukrainian children. As we have mentioned, four million Ukrainians, mostly women with their children, there's um, those who live in Poland, and that's about one million Ukrainian children. And above all, Ukrainian women face the challenge of uh, providing for education for their kids and jobs. Speaking about education for Ukrainian children in Poland, we have uh, established uh, 300 um, seats uh, in the Polish educational system, 185,000 uh, children attend uh, the, Ukraine, uh, the Polish uh, schools. However, there are a lot of challenges for those children. Above all, that's about uh, language barrier and also the difference between the Ukrainian and Polish uh, curricula. Lack of the children's understanding of basic terminology of uh, uh, the uh, uh, various subjects uh, which uh, may um, affect their academic success and their psycho-emotional sta uh, status state and their children feel depressed and they want to be moved to Ukrainian schools. Speaking about Ukrainian schools in Poland, now there are four Ukrainian schools in Poland uh, uh, hosting 3,000 children. And considering that those schools have no funding, no support, they cannot really cover from the state, you mean, yes, sure. So they cannot uh, cover the all those people who would wish to um, have their children study there. And uh, this is only about Warsaw, Wroclaw, and Krakow. And in other uh, cities, uh, there are no opportunities for uh, Ukrainian language education. In Poland, there are 150 offices where they offer Ukrainian language classes, and potentially it would be possible for children to study the Ukrainian language history and culture to preserve the Ukrainian identity, because they do want to 
come back to Ukraine so that they become aware of their identity. But according to the Polish legislation, those offices can only be visited by Polish citizens who are Ukrainians by origin as national minority. So those citizens who went to Poland after the 24th of February, they cannot attend those classes. So today, uh, children encounter this problem where they have no access to Ukrainian language uh, um, interest groups or communities. So if we speak about remote studies online from Ukraine, well, until October, children could easily study online at Ukrainian schools, but we know about the situation. They have to cancel the classes, nobody pursues uh, homework, and uh, uh, teachers cannot control uh, whether the children uh, pursue the curricula. This is delegated to the mothers, to parents as tutors, but mothers, they have their jobs, they're tired. Well, there are some mothers who are very much involved and who can support their children in the academic process, but most mothers, when they are in Poland, they have to look for new jobs and they have, uh, well, while they uh, here in Ukraine, they have medium or high uh, society status. Because of the discrepancies in the labor market, they do not know the language, they do not know the contacts, so they have to undertake manual work. And usually, they stay at work late and they cannot allocate a lot of time for their children. So we have a lot of challenge, uh, challenges regarding the um, education process, but we need to uh, be uh, to honestly admit that uh, Ukraine as a state, as the government doesn't have a, um, a vision on how to develop Ukrainian education, how to bring back children so that they continued studying their language, their history and culture so that they didn't lose their national identity. And also, I would like to uh, emphasize the issue for Ukrainian teachers. Unfortunately, 95% of Ukrainian teachers, they were forced to apply for uh, retire, uh, for resignment. Uh, and uh, they complain. For two months, I've been leading the educational cluster, and I've talked to um, Ukrainian teachers, Ukrainian schools, and I know about their problems. 95% of them had to quit, and they lost their jobs, they lost their experience record. Those few who are left there, they are actually facing this challenge now. And there was this draft law submitted by Roman. That's why they uh, make them uh, apply for uh, quitting because uh, they cannot be fired. Yes, and I believe that the educational cluster will come up with uh, the comment on application of the law and how we can pro protect rights of Ukrainian teachers abroad, because this is our goal, this is our human resources that we need to bring back. But they lose their uh, experience, uh, teaching experience record, they cannot find jobs in Poland, and they work as cleaning ladies. You know, this is nonsense. We must not allow for that. This is the challenge where we need to develop a single vision of how we ensure a high quality Ukrainian education for children abroad, how to increase the number of Ukrainian Sunday schools, for example, if children attend Polish schools, but uh, during weekends or after classes, maybe they could uh, um, continue learning Ukrainian. And what's also important, in some Polish schools, uh, there is the uh, opportunity to study Russian as second uh, foreign language, but not uh, Ukrainian. Um, Ukrainian is not offered as second uh, foreign language. And we are going to contact uh, uh, the ministry, and we contacted Taras. Uh, mm, about that issue that the government needs to go to the Ministry of Education of Poland, to the Prime Minister of Poland, because uh, uh, it would be, if it would be possible to uh, introduce uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian language as second foreign language for our Ukrainian students, uh, for them to pass exams as well, because uh, Actually, the children have no opportunity. They lose this opportunity. They do not uh, 
speak Ukrainian, they forget the Ukrainian language. And of course, it is very important that Ukrainians who, when they are after the 24th of February, so that they could uh, study the Ukrainian at those uh, uh, language uh, uh, training courses, offices. Uh, and actually, it is something that can be revised and changed uh, with the order of um, the ministry and support of the treasury. So we need to advocate and defend our interests. And I have this request to Roman as a member of the Educational Committee. At the legislative level, we need to settle the issue of uh, Ukrainian education abroad. Because if you take uh, Israel or Poland, we can specifically speak about Russia. So they have they develop, uh, they set up educational facilities abroad and they finance them and they train the teachers who go abroad to work there. That's their mission. And then they support, they provide uh, national education to their citizens. What Russia did just last example, when they occupied Kherson, the first thing they did, they brought Russian teachers to our territory and they made them uh, made the children to pursue the uh, Russian curriculum. So they understand that after security issues, uh, the educational aspect is the second most important one. So we need to come up with legislative initiatives, how to develop Ukrainian educational services for Ukrainians abroad, especially in those countries where we have now the greatest number of Ukrainian mothers and children, and, and that's Poland and other neighboring countries in Europe. Very briefly to respond to that, I agree this is really and they are very sad what's happening. Speaking about teachers, why they make them uh, submit applications? Because according to the law, they cannot be fired. And then uh, educational departments of education and schools, they have uh, they look for ways to circumvent uh, to circumvent that. But uh, and then thus they use this co coercive practices, and we see that we cannot protect teachers there. So. When schools come up uh, with these complaints via the minister or the department, but there is no systemic ongoing dialogue. Because when I developed that draft law, it was uh, relevant for back then. And now, when, uh, when the new academic year has started, and the principal says that uh, uh, I have IDP teachers here, uh, and they are ready to replace those teachers who are abroad now. And that's a dilemma. Imagine yourself in the shoes of that principal. So there is a teacher who can work online, and there is an IDP person who is ready to uh, to work in, uh, on a full-fledged basis. So we need to approach that in this way. Speaking about international schools, sure, uh, Russia uses soft force. And Tali, it has uh, one Ukrainian school and uh, a number of uh, Russian schools. And actually, this is where they transform Ukrainian kids into Russian speakers. So we need to do that via MFA, Minister of Education, our diplomatic missions. Speaking about fast solutions, what we are developing now. The problem where children have to attend the Polish schools and also uh, pursue the Ukrainian curriculum. This is double workload, and that's hard for the kids. So we said that we need to facilitate that for those kids. We need to focus on the Ukrainian language, literature, and history. Uh, let the children not to choose between the two options, Polish or Ukrainian, because it's too hard to pursue the both curricula. Then a pressing issue is uh, the adequate Ukrainian school online, not just a library um, databases. Now we have the new Ukrainian school, which is not working now. Now we are developing the idea. This is kind of Uber school. Cool. We have teachers abroad who want to work, who want to undergo, uh, undertake some slots when they are ready to work. And we have those kids abroad who, uh, no matter whether they pursue their curriculum of the host country, they need to 
keep in touch with the Ukrainian education. So this is about linking those teachers who can work online from abroad and kids who are also abroad. So we are working on that, and we have included this uh, into the budget as a priority a solution, maybe to cover those needs. But in long-term prospect, we need to launch the schools in those countries. Thank you. And we continue with the theme of enhancing the economic role of women. Of course, what's important for us is that, well, uh, the uh, women will come back if they have some prospects to find jobs here, re-qualification, any kind of job. And we understand that in the future we will need to develop SMEs. And of course, uh, that is uh, the most adaptive uh, format of business. So, Ina, my question goes to you. Can you share more information about your business? I understand that you started your business in 2015 during the war, so the war has been ongoing for you, and it, of course, had a very dramatic effect on you because your enterprise was in butcher, it was fully destroyed, and you had to relocate, but you managed to preserve that business. How did you manage that, and what were the challenges? You know, and generally, I feel like uh, it is a time of stories now, and we need to share those stories every minute, every day, because this is an example of resilience and ability to adapt and support this spirit of entrepreneurship, above all. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard and seen and to listen to all of you. It is a big joy for me, and I feel like I am uh, getting full of that resource that I am so necessary. The first thing I want to tell you is that my son uh, studied in the 11th grade with um, military preparation, and his teacher was an ATO soldier, and the knowledge he provided, it was, you know, it was a genius idea to have a former soldier teach defense of, defense of the motherland. It gave my son such a different prospect, this scheme of tolerance in his head that education gives you. You know, those Soldiers give the children the right worldview, help them find their identity. His, he understood who he was only thanks to this teacher. The teacher had no illusions. Between September 1st and February 24th, this teacher was preparing children for the war. He was telling them everything, how to act in the situation. So thanks to this child, we were ready. I am a mom. We have four. Uh, I have four children. My uh, eldest daughter is my business partner, and I have three sons. When I started having one son after another, you know, uh, old ladies are saying that when you have multiple sons, there is going to be a war, and it was very scary for me because I didn't want my children to fight for the country, to give up their lives for the country. Um, I want them to live for this country, too, and that's why I create businesses, and I'm very happy that this idea was expressed. It inspires me, it gives me strength to work. As an entrepreneur, I know that I will stay strong, I will work, that I will will continue making the best possible product, but I need confidence that the government is taking care of something bigger, our identity, our education, because there are problems indeed. I will tell you briefly how we handled this, because we lived next to the Hostomel airport. The bombing started at 4 a.m. As you know, we saw uh, the Maria airplane from the window of our house every day, and we were prepared. I took my four children. Thankfully, I did have a car, so it was just the children, just the car, and we uh, kept going. I uh, suspended all emotions. I wasn't scared. I didn't feel the fear. I felt like it was a mission. I uh, didn't let myself think about. Uh, the business that I left behind, although it was our only source of income. 
I was completely self-fulfilled in my city. If you ever saw anything about Bucha, I was happy there. I knew that if I had one life given to me, I would live it in Bucha. We were more happy than we could ever imagine. But of course, in February 24th, things changed. We stayed in the Czech Republic for 42 days. 42 because we counted every day. As soon as Bucha was deoccupied, I went there by myself first to take a look what was happening to my enterprise. We had a natural cosmetics uh, enterprise. You know, that enterprise was like a baby for me. You know how hard it is to make cosmetics in Ukraine. You constantly prove to everyone that it is good that we can produce uh, cosmetics just as good as global brands. People don't believe you, but you keep working, you keep going. And then I was going there and didn't know what to expect. The buildings were uh, standing there, but the um, everything inside was ruined. Everything was dirty. They stole everything they could. They destroy everything. They Mm, cannot take. They leave behind the stench. They took away even personal items, everything possible. And uh, I received help from volunteers. When I was in the Czech Republic with my daughter, I of course couldn't just stay calm. I mm, wanted to get involved. So we were looking for UAVs, for thermal vision goggles. I think that um, it is such a great resource that we Ukrainians get united in this. And volunteers we were helping came to Bucha. A man whose son died on the 19th of March had a truck and he said that the last thing his son said to me, Dad, help people. As long as you live in Ukraine, help Ukrainians. And those people just blocked their nose with their fingers because the stench was horrible. Uh, the remnants of that equipment, they, they took it in the, into the truck and they uh, moved it. Uh, we did set up heavy equipment. We are now working live thanks to those people. You know, I was thinking war, cosmetics, uh, you know, they don't go together. But, you know, I didn't understand what was happening to me in those 40 days. People started looking for our stores. We had a franchising opening on the 19th of uh, February. Can you imagine that? People started buying, uh, the, buying the brand because it was from Bucha. They thought it wouldn't be there anymore. And I told people, I will be making those things by hand because I know how to do it. I can complain, of course, that there was a problem finding a place to rent. Uh, Looking, looking for uh, funding and so on. But you know, we are Ukrainians, we are resilient. The second point is employees. You cannot work online. <coughs> you have to go there. Finding a technologist of a cosmetic enterprise is like finding an astronaut. Who knows how to do this? But thanks to the fact that I know how to do this. <coughs> And of course, things uh, like packaging, sorting, those are things that they are easier to find people for. But we are uh, now uh, back. We restored our pre-war level within three months, just because this is a family business. And we worked, I don't know, when partners started showing up from all across the world. Can you imagine? as a Ukrainian cosmetics brand, receiving emails from Latvia, Lithuania, Japan, Estonia, Poland, Sweden, Belgium invited us, Italy. And they said, we want to sell your cosmetics, but we cannot produce it yet uh, because we don't have the necessary equipment, but they want to sell it. So there is this trust already. 
and I understand that I am responsible for the standards set by our fighters, our people, the standard of courage, of prudence, of strength. I understand that I am a carrier of Ukrainian identity, and through business I show how cool we are. Our potential partner from Poland said, can you produce 3,000 items? Mm. And we said, sure, and they said, how come? We saw your enterprise, and they said, you saw enterprise, but you don't know us yet. We will do everything possible. And I am thankful to this opportunity because, you know, my daughter and I were trying to help everyone we could help, we could reach women from Mariupol IDPs. And then we said, let's do something that we do best. And when you speak about values, when we write the word values, I thought that the value of our brand is that we always take care of the body because our body is in danger. And when there is a uh, plant-based brand, we had our own fields, our own plants. I guarantee that every uh, item we have it's called Vasna Spring. I guarantee that each item is completely natural and safe. Once I started relocating without uh, equipment, I started making ointments for the front line. I said, we won't be making money. I was looking for beekeepers. They gave. Uh, wax and oil to me and we did a lot of that we sent a lot of ointments to the front line we still do and when i hear they are actually helpful and they are very convenient i i have a sample in my bag and says you are a hero and when a fighter says it, it hurts me to shoot but within two days your ointment made me better and i could shoot again it gives you so much strength, it inspires you so much that I feel that we are at the stage of history and we are restarting, relaunching history. I think we are a great people and we need to understand that the standards set, set by our fighters at the front line, we are all responsible for maintaining that. Thank you very much for your attention for such a long time. Mm, uh, thank you very much. I thought I would be crying because of the losses, but I am crying because of the uh, resilience that our people have shown. You know, I think that my value is inspiring people because we are unbreakable. Thank you. And of course, we all understand that this uh, unbreakability is also about partnerships. And to wrap up our panel, I have to thank all our partners, the partners of the Ukrainian Women's Congress, organized by uh, uh, NGO Ukrainian Women's Congress, which took place as part of a UN Women project, uh, first phase, with funding of the government of Norway and with support of National Democratic Institute, the U USAID, um, uh, the government of Sweden, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Canada, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, and the um, electoral system funding. The Congress also was supported by the Unit with Europe program, uh, funded by Germany, Poland, Estonia, Denmark, Slovenia, and other EU partners in order to strengthen local government. EU lead contributes to transparent uh, multi level governance in Ukraine, supporting communities. We spoke a lot about communities today. The Congress is also held with the support of Lena Pinchuk's foundation as part of the Coca-Cola uh, Fund Agency. And other partners are uh, Eurofem Association of Women Lawyers and Center for Civic Liberties. Thank you very much, and I hope that our following discussions will be just as fast, just as uh, precise and targeted. We will be crying only of happiness. Thank you.
Дослідуємо естафету українського жіночого конгресу. Продовжуємо. Oh. We are continuing Ukraine Women's Congress and we organically continue the subject of uh, women's role in the economic and social life. My name is Olga Serdyuk, I'm director of Lan Minjuk Foundation and today my guest is Marin Marchenko, co-founder and president of NGO uh, LADA. I will explain why we are sitting here, the two of us. The Lana Pinchuk Foundation has a large project that we have been implementing since 2017 together with Coca-Cola Foundation. And as part of this project and also during the war, we already implemented several really nice projects which support women entrepreneurs. And Inna uh, from Vesna Brand, who was such a firecrack in the previous uh, panel, is one of the participants of our uh, project's Women Business Booster Effect, which we implemented together with Lviv Business School. She received a grant together with her daughter. So I am thankful to her for her presence at the discussion panel today. And together with NGO Lada and with Marina, we implemented a super cool project which is called the Time is Now. And even though the time is now now being a very difficult time, we still found tools to work with the project audience. Uh, namely moms on maternity leave who would like to start a career or go back to the job market and since I am interviewing you could you please share what was happening in our project and what results we obtained yes of course I think it is no secret for anyone that unfortunately women don't have enough mechanisms and opportunities to go back to the job market we had this problem before the war, and the war exacerbates this problem. Our project started, but just three days we obtained 10,000 registrations. What is 10,000 registrations for a platform that will help you go uh, back to the labor market from a maternity leave. This means, this illustrates, we chose the most relevant subject. It was important for women to combine maternity with their professional activity. We helped them psychologically. We taught them how to um, handle the child, how to um, organize breastfeeding, how to compile a resume and apply for a job of your dreams. Uh, at two-thirds of the project, the war broke out. We had to adapt. We had to show resilience. We added blocks explaining what PTSD is, how to continue working and surviving in these conditions, how to speak to a child about this, how to keep taking care of yourself, and what additional opportunities the international market provides to Ukraine today. So we adapted as much as possible, and I think uh, the several thousand women who have graduated from this project are a good result. We shouldn't stop now, especially now during the war, when many people are on the front line. Not everyone will come back, uh, uh, not everyone will come back the way they used to be. Women are now the primary caretakers uh, of the family, and we have to keep supporting them in this. Thank you for summing up this project. Thank you for your cooperation. I hope we can continue this next year. Speaking about the economic independence and capacity of women. Today, at discussion panels, we spoke a lot about women who are currently abroad. As I heard from Alibanova, uh, there are a lot of women abroad who are from Kyiv and from Kharkiv, they are active, they are a big part of the economy. At the previous discussion we also said that these women were faced with a choice, either to become a mom or to become a business manager, or they had to make a choice. But when last week I was in the same room at Kiev International Economic Forum and I listened to one panel about leaders and managers, everyone said uh, 
that a leader cannot manage their team remaining in the context of war remotely. So I want to ask your uh, opinion about women who remain moms and um, business leaders who chose Ukraine, who chose their economic independence, who chose working for Ukraine's economy. They are in this sort of gray area. What is your opinion about their life choice? Thank you very much uh, for this uh, question. Like I would like to start with that. Uh, I'm the head of civil society organization and I have two children. I have been in Ukraine all this time. And we understand, and uh, so society organizations, we understand that all difficulties that Ukrainian mothers face, I really respect the topic about how to bring uh, women with children home. And we talk a lot about this, uh, but we shouldn't forget about those women with children who are staying in Ukraine. There are more than five millions of them. And now they uh, give birth uh, with uh, sirens. Uh, they feed their children without electricity or water. And they take them to kindergarten. And uh, they need to explain to kids why playground was closed or why uh, they spend all day in a bomb shelter. And in this uh, condition, they also need to have a job. They also need to keep working. Uh, they need to stand uh, to build the country and their career at the same time. And we shouldn't forget about them. And we definitely need to think about additional programs of mental support and also uh, uh, providing this economic capability for these uh, women. It's uh, the mental condition for all these women. Every third uh, woman uh, from our audience, they need to take antidepressants uh, or they needed to consult with a specialist. And uh, uh, every Ukrainian person uh, will live with PTSD. And we say that um, mother and uh, mother has a child uh, to like that's, the child is the future uh, to and it's possible to bring this uh, child uh, to better condition to some uh, uh, to give them some rest and support. But if the child comes back to the family uh, with parents who are in this very difficult mental condition, so then uh, it will be all back. So we don't we don't uh, take care enough about the mother. So because we take care of pregnant women, then we take care of a child, but we don't support a mo uh, mother enough because they do all the housework, they do educational work uh, with all these blackouts. And so we definitely need to support uh, mothers and because they definitely need our attention. And it's not only about teachers or public servants, whether to go abroad or stay. Basically, every profession which requires uh, physical presence here it requires uh, this choice, yeah, whether I take the child or I'm staying here. So it's a global issue how we can create uh, safe conditions and uh, how we can provide this uh, mental support for women. Thank you very much for your time, for your opinion, and for visiting Ukraine Women's Congress. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me and to be next to you and discuss this very important, private, but very important issues for the country. Так, 
Доброго дня всім. Я радий, що можу вести цю спеціальну зустріч, спеціальну подію на форумі жіночому в Києві. І хотів привітати також наших гостей з Варшави. Як розумію, вони до нас долучилися вже онлайн або долучаються до нас онлайн. Бардзо сердечне вітам з Києва, наші гості в Варшаві. Широ вас вітаю з Києва, наші гостей у Варшаві. І мене звати Андрій Дещиця, я донедавна був послом України в Польщі. І єстем екс-амбасадором України в Жачопосполітій Польській. І в останні кілька місяців був свідком того, як радикально змінилися наші відносини на кращі українсько-польські відносини. Очевидно, ми будемо говорити сьогодні про ці відносини, але будемо також говорити і про досвід Będziemy dziś mówili o doświadczeniu organizacji polskich, o zmianę w polskim społeczeństwie, które się odbywają w ciągu ostatnich 30 lat, w tym jak nasi sąsiedzi, partnerzy, przyjaciele w Polsce, jak się komunikują z NGO-sami z państwa, może państwo się podzielą swoim doświadczeniem i pytanie, które chciałbym postawić do wszystkich uczestników tego panelu, jak powinniśmy dalej pracować, być solidarni, bo przecież właśnie ta solidarność była najbardziej charakterystyczną cechą społeczeństwa polskiego, i właśnie to odczuliśmy w stosunku do Ukraińców od Polaków w tym roku. Na początku wojny 3 miliony ukraińskich obywateli przyjechało do Polski i przede wszystkim były to dzieci, kobiety i na początku Trochę byliśmy zagubieni, nie wiedzieliśmy co dalej robić i byłem zachwycony. I chciałam powiedzieć, że i moi koledzy, dyplomaci, ambasadorzy i nasi partnerzy w Polsce, w rządzie, w samorządach byli pod wrażeniem tego, jak bardzo ukraińskie kobiety były wdzięczne za to, jak je potraktowano w Polsce. I oczywiście pragniemy podziękować Polakom, którzy udostępnili tym kobietom mieszkania, a później oczywiście kobiety znalazły mieszkania, znalazły szkoły dla dzieci, walczyły o to, by też були всі під враженням, що буквально через там два-три місяці почалися ці тенденції про те, щоб українські жінки почали творити. Тренди, що кобіти українські почали організовувати інтереси вже в Польщі. І вручимо зараз до наших гостей. Віце-маршалек Сейму Жечі Посполітій Польської Малгожата Кідаби-Бонську. Mam też przyjemność przywitać pani minister Barbara Labudę. Ministra Barbaru Labudu, jaka także przyjedna się do naszej dyskusji, a również dwie aktywne Ukrainki, aktywistki działające w Warszawie, w Polsce, pani Mirosława Kerek, założycielka ukraińskiego domu w Polsce, z którą wiele współpracowaliśmy oraz z panią Swietłanę Wojciechowską, która jest teraz w Polsce, współzałożycielkę Ukraińskiego Kongresu Kobiet, która teraz też jest w Polsce. Pragnę teraz się zwrócić do pani marszał i poprosić jej rozpowiedzieć nam o Її думку, як ви оцінюєте сьогоднішню ситуацію польських жінок у Польщі і якраз з точки зору польських організацій, з українськими організаціями, 
з громадськими організаціями і взагалі з українцями, що живуть у Польщі, зокрема з українцями, які прибули до Польщі протягом останніх місяців. Будь ласка, скажіть також декілька слів про рішення, які були прийняті, а були визначені під час, прийняті під час жіночого конгресу у Вроцлаві. І ще декілька технічних питань. В нас є по 5 хвилин для кожного спікера, і потім наприкінці дискусії ми зробимо, підведемо підсумок, а взагалі то наша дискусія триватиме 30 хвилин. Будь ласка, пані маршал. Бачу, я тут бачу, пані міністр. Коментарі на те, Wszystkich bardzo serdecznie przepraszam, ale mieliśmy problemy techniczne. Witam bardzo serdecznie wszystkie panie, wszystkie siostry. Wszystkie niezłomne bohaterki wolnej, niepodległej Ukrainy. Ja jestem bardzo szczęśliwa i dumna, że mogę dzisiaj zabrać głos, że mogę na tym szóstym kongresie z paniami porozmawiać. To jest coś niezwykłego, że w tak ekstremalnie trudnym czasie potrafiłyście zorganizować ten kongres i myślicie o przyszłości. Myślicie o przyszłości, a nie można myśleć o przyszłości, o wolności bez kobiet. I to, co robicie, naprawdę jest wyjątkowe i tak naprawdę to wy jesteście dzisiaj dla nas przykładem tego, jak należy działać, jak należy być odważną. I tak naprawdę to my dzisiaj tutaj w Polsce powinniśmy się od was tego wszystkiego uczyć. Jesteście po prostu dla nas wzorem. Widzę jeszcze jakieś wypowiedzi, a jak nie, to mam też pytania do Pani. No właśnie, czekam. To a jak Pani ocenia teraz e, e, tą e, e, aktywność ukraińskich kobiet w Polsce? Що можуть зробити українські жінки у Польщі? Як можна спільно привести до того, щоб їхня ситуація була, хочу сказати, щоб вони почувалися більше, як вдома? Те, що нам вдалося побудувати протягом останніх місяців, це щось виняткове. Це величезний зв'язок поміж нашими двома країнами. І це величезний, неймовірний капітал, який ми не можемо змарнувати. Це дозволить нам потім відбудувати Україну. А зараз всім українкам і українським сім'ям запевнити, забезпечити безпечні умови для життя. Я дуже добре пам'ятаю останній жіночий конгрес у Вроцлаві. Там було дуже сильне представництво українських жінок, які живуть у Польщі зараз, і їх голос був дуже важливий у цих дебатах. 
обов'язкова, безпосередня співпраця, можливість розвиватися, навчатися і одержувати підтримку у кожній сфері життя. Тому що дуже важливо зараз, щоб українські жінки у Польщі почувалися безпечно і могли вже зараз готуватися, готуватися до повернення до незалежної і вільної України. Дуже дякую вам, пані маршал, пані спікер, але також у нас є запитання про те, як ви бачите розвиток жіночого руху у Польщі, польського жіночого руху, які важливі питання стоять у програмі цього руху. Звісно, ми говоримо зараз про війну, про українсько-польську співпрацю, про безпеку українських жінок у Польщі, але ми хотіли також дізнатися, чим взагалі займається польський рух жінок у Польщі. Жінки у громадському житті завжди були присутні, але не завжди були помітні. В історії нашої країни не було б одержання незалежності без жінок. І у часи ще 18 століття, коли Польщі не було на карті, то жінки займалися виховуванням наступних поколінь і потім намагалися відбудувати Польщі після одержання незалежності так само у 80-ті роки. Там вони завжди були, але не завжди їх помічали. І що для нас, польських жінок, дуже важливо, і ми про це дуже часто і вголос говоримо, це питання освіти у нашій країні. Освіта дуже важлива, вона створює майбутнє наших поколінь. Друге важливе питання для жінок – це, звісно, безпека жінок з кожної точки зору, починаючи від безпеки здоров'я до екології і економіки. В кожній сфері життя жінки хочуть почуватися безпечно, вони тоді зможуть жити, працювати як слід, коли вони знатимуть, що їх будуть підтримувати держава, буде добра освіта для дітей, дитячі садочки. І вони тоді зможуть робити те, про що вони мріють реалізуватися. І щоб це було, відбулося дуже важлива співпраця поміж жінками, щоб вони таким чином підтримували одна одну, щоб вони почувалися сміливо, щоб вони не самі щоб вони знали, що ця скляна стеля лише в нашій уяві, і це від нас залежить, наскільки швидко вона зникне. Дуже дякую вам, пані спікер, пані маршал. В нас вже залишилася половина часу до кінця цієї дискусії, тому дозвольте мені запросити зараз пані Барбару Лабуду, пані міністерку. І, звісно, будь ласка, пані спікер, залиштеся з нами ще на цій панелі ще декілька хвилин, щоб відповісти на запитання, наприклад, або підвести підсумок дискусії. Пані міністр, в мене до вас запитання, яке тут, в Україні, історично дуже добре відоме. Ви були дуже активною у Русі Солідарності у 80-ті роки, потім дуже активна у громадському житті, у житті держави. І як ви з точки зору сьогоднішнього дня бачите цю боротьбу, яку ви пройшли протягом цих десятків років у Польщі? Який досвід ви могли б передати українським жінкам, які могли б навчатися від вашого успіху? Ні, 
svoju premisku v mojom chráme. Ja rozumiem, že to bezčasné hovorím o tých, čo zaradí iné, ale to by mal byť iný kresťan. Mi netreba bude, že budú urobiť v církve. Same tak. Dobrého dňa, pane posol. I ja takož pochyľajú sa nízko, nízky uklín žinkám, mojim podruhám, mojim kolegám z Ukrajiny. I našim šestrom ukrajinským, ktoré som v Polsce. I našim ukrajinským sestram u Polsce. Bardzo, bardzo štrdečné pozdravienie. Ja duže, duže štíro vitajú všich žinok, účastníc kongresu. I s výrazami zvyčenstva v vojne. Z życzeniami zwycięstwa w wojnie. I chodźcie pobażaty wszystkim nam, jako mocha szwedzka i perymogę. My w zachodzie od was, od waszej wielczesnej sily, od waszej odwagi. Panie minister, wasza walka o wolność w latach 80. to była walka, którą przeprowadziła w sumie e, Solidarność i inne organizacje e, w tych czasach, powst które powstały w tych czasach. A nasza walka o wolność to jest bardziej walka na wojnie. Ale ja wracam do tego samego, do tej kwestii, do, do, do pytania, które już zadałem. Co według Pani można było przekazać po tym, jak wojna się skończy, jakie zmiany w społeczeństwie byłyby ważne, bo oczywiście e, te zmiany nastąpią, ale żeby ich przeprowadzić, to trzeba dużo pracy i doświadczenia, które macie, na, bardzo by nam pomogło. Tak, i, i właśnie to, że teraz myślicie o normalności, która I te, na pewno nadejdzie, zaraz dumajte, pro uważam za normalne życie, jakie nadejdzie na pewno, ja uważam dużo słuszne. I w odnoczas, choć o nagadate, że ja była ministrem w kancelarii prezydenta Kwasniewskiego, ja zaraz w opozycji, ja lewy liberal, czemu ja to podkreślę, to muszę na moją думку, to, co odbywa się w Polsce zaraz, było inaczej wyglądało. Tutaj jedna z moich kolegów na waszym kongresie powiedziała o tym, że w niektórych szkołach nie jest bardzo dobra sytuacja. I ja spodziewam się, że jakby inni ludzie kierowali szkołami, było po innemu. Ale Відповідаючи на ваше запитання, пане после, хочу сказати одну дуже важливу річ, яку необхідно зробити. Я нікого тут не хочу повчати. Це те, що не можна так зробити, щоб жінки не могли, не могли, не мали впливу на управління країною для нашого суспільства, для кращої політики, більш справедливої, необхідно це справедливо, щоб жінки також вирішували разом із чоловіками, скрізь, де приймаються рішення. Ми у солідарності після одержання незалежності, коли побудовували, будували нову Польщу, дещо тут небагато зусиль приклали. А участь жінок у боротьбі, незломних жінок, сміливість жінок, їхня солідарність, їхня намагання, боротьба про свободу і демократію – це саме діяльність жінок. І про це забули і жінки, якимось чином були відсунуті від прийняття рішень. Зараз жінки дуже мало що можуть вирішувати, і вони передусім допомагають. І саме так це виглядає в країнах, де відбуваються, де ситуація жінок набагато гірша. І не можуть жінки там нічого робити і вирішувати. І чому це так відбувається? Не тому, що жінки гірші, а чоловіки кращі. 
і жінки більш чутливі, а чоловіки – ні. Просто жінкам приписують деякі ролі і не дозволяють їм реалізувати важливі речі, наші громадські політичні думки. А факт, що в жінок інший досвід, цей досвід, коли ми переносимо на мову політики, на політичну стратегію, це для суспільства просто благословіння, тому що тоді громадське життя, політичне життя набагато більш справедливе і різноманітне. І тоді звертається увага на ті питання, де чоловіча рішучість не просто не помічає тих питань. І тому дуже важливо, щоб жінки приймали участь у керуванні на всіх рівнях влади, на всіх сферах управління державою. Ми в Польщі зробили таку річ завдяки, між іншим, Конгресу жінок в різних місцях, в різних установах, і в органах самоуправління це так відбувається, і так само у приватних компаніях, в різних установах. Нам вдалося змінити навіть закон про вибори. Так, щоб цей закон був більш справедливий і допоміг жінкам також потрапляти у парламент, щоб мати вплив на те, що відбувається в державі. І дуже важлива річ – це факт, щоб не допустити, щоб у партіях і далі, я маю на увазі політичні партії, працював механізм, який не дає жінкам можливість себе виражати і реалізувати у політиці. ...і відбудові нашого панства. Proszę zostać, jeszcze jesteśmy przez kolejne 10 minut, jeżeli pani może to e, zostać przy, przy e, dyskusji, którą dalej prowadzimy e, w, z naszymi gośćmi z Warszawy. A zaraz ja chcę przekazać słowo... Ja chcę zaprosić pani Mirosławu Kerek, ja spodziewam się, że ona jest z nami. Мирослава, яка була засновником Українського дому в Варшаві, починаючи, мені здається, з 2014 року, і з якою ми багато попрацювали, але в останні місяці Мирослава дуже активно підключилася до громадського, ще більше, ніж на щодень, до громадського життя в Польщі. І я передаю слово Мирославі, щоб розказати, які зараз виклики стоять перед українцями в Польщі, перед українками, яких є дуже багато в Польщі, які проекти і які заходи «Український дім» реалізовує в цьому контексті. Дякую, пане посол. Дуже рада з вами спілкуватися. І теж хочу подякувати організаторам Конгресу за запрошення мене як представниць української організації в Польщі. Я хочу підкреслити, що більшість українських організацій, які тут діють, засновані і членкинями, яких є жінки. Так що це теж показує, яка сила жінок теж в діаспорі. І тут дуже важливо, що ми теж є, тобто ми і особі є на Конгресі. Я вважаю, що це теж величезний виклик і теж така потреба, щоб ми наш голос теж чули в Україні, оскільки ми тут фактично теж представляємо Україну, є тим голосом України, підкреслюємо потреби українок, українців, які мешкають в Польщі та ж інших країнах. І дуже важливо, якби, власне, бути, вести той діалог, і щоб ми мали свої представництва чи в рамках жіночого конгресу, чи в іншій Польщі, в Україні. 
Це тому я дуже вдячна, що можу говорити сьогодні. Стосовно теж, може, тільки коротко, наприклад, що ми робимо, щоб ви зрозуміли, як багато роблять теж інші українські організації в Польщі. Ми, з одної сторони, нас досвід допомоги українським мігрантам, і ми на цьому будували допомогу українським біженцям після 24 лютого. Це і поселення людей, це теж ми відкрили школу, ми відкрили кілька українських клубів українських жінок. Ми займаємось теж допомогою волонтерами в чи на вокзалах, чи в місцях, в шелтерах. Також ми допомагаємо нашу, якби якщо йдеться про освіту, ми вже відкрили школу, де вчить 270 дітей. Подібних шкіл відкрилось кілька в Польщі. Це теж переважно українські організації, в яких працюють жінки. Ми теж долучились з допомогою в Україні. Це на Близько 35 мільйонів гривень ми допомагали чи тактичною медициною, чи теж наметами для лікарень і багато іншого спорядження, яке ми передавали. І це теж крапля, яку я можу сказати в загальному обсязі допомоги, яку несе, несуть українські організації, які діють в Польщі. І тут я вважаю, ще раз хочу підкреслити, що зараз для жінок тут в Польщі дуже важливе теж відчуття, що про них пам'ятають, їх знає, про них думають в Україні, що ми є частиною великої України, тобто ми презентуємо, ми є частиною України тут в Польщі. Жінки потребують підтримки психологічної, тому що дуже багато з них, на жаль, були, жили під обстрілами, чи мають, власне, вже нас згадано раніше в іншій дискусії про е, об'яви ПТСД, теж, теж вони потребують груп підтримки. Тому, наприклад, ми створили клуби українських жінок, де жінки взаємно себе підтримують, де вони передають свої кваліфікації, щоб могти теж підтримати інших жінок. І це ініціатива наша вже кілька років діє, але тепер вона набрала нового змісту, тому що ці нові жінки, які приїхали зараз, вони не планували емігрувати, не вимушено тут. І їм ж тим більше потрібна підтримка, що вони, хоча в іншій країні, вони все ж таки можуть чутися хоч в якомусь місці у себе, і це дуже важливо. Теж, ну, є, є теж питання нашого представництва. Тут поки що ми, ми не маємо виборчих прав, тобто ми не можемо, розказ, не можемо бути голосом нашої спільноти. Тому це наше завдання для того, щоб жити в Польщі, як бути представленою теж в політичному житті, представляти частину польського суспільства, яким тепер є українці і українки. І, власне, друге завдання – це представляти на голос українок і українців в Польщі. О, перепрошую, в Україні. Дякую, пані Мирославо. Ми мусимо завершувати, бо ще дати слово Світлані Войцеховській. Але хочу подякувати вам за вашу роботу, яку ви робите в Польщі, і побажати, щоб ці плани, які ви перед собою поставили, або ці завдання, які хотіли осягнути, були зреалізованими. І... Зараз я хотів передати слово Світлані Войцеховській, співзасновниці Українського жіночого конгресу, яка зараз є в Польщі, і попросити пані Світлану зробити такий своєрідний підсумок сьогоднішньої цієї дискусії, але також і того досвіду і співпраці, яка, яку на... Безпосередньо пані Світлана має можливість відчувати і е, перебуваючи в Польщі. Не, не чути зараз вас, хвилиночку. Ми вас бачимо, але не чуємо. А так чуємо. О, так чуємо. І бачимо, і чуємо. Щиро вітаю всіх учасників і учасниць, дорогі посестри, рада бути з вами сьогодні. І попри все ми разом, ми вірні своїм ідеям, і, і це є наша сила. Сьогодні на кожній панелі ми задавали питання, чи змінила війна українських жінок. Так, і ми відкрили свої найкращі риси і силу українських жінок, воюючи на фронті, допомагати сортувати гуманітарну 
допомогу, рятуючи дітей. І саме цікаве те, що сила українських жінок під час війни змінила весь жіночий рух. Я можу це вам сказати, очевидно, від, перебуваючи в Польщі, що жінки своєю силою змінили і активізували е, жіночий рух в Польщі е, більш активно, бути більш активними, е, відстоювати інтереси не тільки своїх е, польських жінок, а й українських, е, в тому числі, про що говорили мої шановні колежанки сьогодні е, на цій панелі. Е, Особливо хочу подякувати громадянській платформі «Польський конгрес кобіт», бо вони стали не тільки ініціатором цілої низки ініціатив в Польщі, але вони стали тим адвокатами під час конгресу у Вроцлаві, який був повністю присвячений ситуації в Україні. І хочу теж від імені Українського жіночого конгресу, від імені співголів, всіх учасників подякувати нашим польським колежанкам в їх обличчі, всьому польському народу за ту допомогу, яка відбуває, відбувається впродовж 9 місяців. Бажно дякуємо полякам, всім за допомогу. За... Дуже дякуємо всім полякам за допомогу, за підтримку. Україна цього не забуде. Від усього серця дякую. Я думаю, що це якраз хороший підсумок нашої дискусії. Подякувати полякам за цю допомогу, яку вони надали впродовж останніх місяців і продовжують надавати, і які підтвердили своїми діями те, що Україна, це я колись ще пару місяців тому назад, знайшла собі в особі Польщі нову сестру. Втративши брата на Сході, знайшла сестру на Заході. І я сподіваюся, що... Якщо можна, ще одне слово, яке би я хотіла так. і які, які би ми винесли підсумок із нашої сьогоднішньої зустрічі. Про те, що говорили наші польські колежанки. Е, По-перше, ми не маємо права е, допустити е, відсутності жінок при розробці програм по відбудові України. Про те, що говорила пані міністерка. Це надзвичайно важливо. По-друге, українки за кордоном мусять відчувати, що держава потребує їх повернення. І це одне із завдань лідерок і лідерів політики міжраційного об'єднання рівні можливості в парламенті державних установ, щоб при розробках програми і при їх реалізації були присутні жінки. І основне, ми не маємо прати успіху досягнень жіночого руху в Україні за останні 30 років і останні 8 років чи 9. Завдання Українського жіночого конгресу, я думаю, адвокувати ці гострі питання і продовжувати об'єднувати громадські організації тут в Україні безпосередньо і в Польщі для адвокації цих питань. Дуже дякую всім. Обіймаю і до зустрічі вдома. Дякую, пані Світлано. Дякую також за всім учасникам сьогоднішньої панелі за участь і дискусію, і погляди висловлені. Але хочу підсумувати ще таким спогадом, який сказала пані спікерка Малгожата Кидава-Блонська про те, що українські жінки стали зразком для польських жінок як себе поводити в критичних ситуаціях. І я е, сподіваюся, що цей приклад буде поширений не лише на Польщу, але на решту світу. Дякую вам за участь і бажаю успіхів подальших в реалізації своїх планів. Дякую теж. Дуже дякую і бажаю вам успіхів у всьому, що ми робимо. Запрошуємо вас до Києва, шановні наші польські колеги. Дуже сподіваємось, що невдовзі зможемо побачитися і зустрітися очно в Києві або в Варшаві. Дякую.
And we continue talking to guests of the Sex Women's Congress. And now I'm happy to introduce to you Evgenia Velika, representative of uh, Arm uh, Women Now project. Hello, and I have to uh, to correct you a little bit. That's about arm, not our trade. Yes. And uh, uh, Evgenia, what you are doing, it is obvious from the name of the project, so you deal directly with the army. And what you are doing, that's incredible, because now to the girls who are at the front line, and there's a dozens of thousands of women at the front line, and not only so, you uh, help them to recover comfort and also femininity to some extent, even though the war seems to be not a good place for that. So the initiative of uh, producing a uh, uniform for women, so what's wrong with the currently available uniform? Thank you for this opportunity to provide you with more detailed information about our project. So the idea to start producing uniform for women appeared in spring when we received the request for men's uniform, but uh, small size. We did not quite understand what was the problem. Uh, but then we discovered that actually a girl, uh, a woman, needed that uniform. And then we started looking for opportunities to buy a uniform for women, but we discovered that it was not quite possible. And that's how we developed that idea to develop a uniform for women. Currently, we have already passed over to the front line to our women 1,400 sets, and we continue doing that. We are producing new uniform on the ongoing basis, even though there are some production related issues because there are electricity shutdowns, but we keep working. When we, when you meet uh, uh, women at the front line, they don't really like it uh, when you ask them about the difficulties, about like a hot so uh, shower, some comfort. They are quite uh, uh, resentful when you ask that them about that, uh, and uh, they say we are just as everyone else. And here you speak specifically about clothes, about uniform, and. Uh, Quite a lot of people told me that it is not that convenient for women to wear uh, male uniform. There are problems with uh, the uh, specific issues. So, sure, there are anatomic specifics for women. Women have uh, a narrower waist, uh, wider hips, and uh, also the shoulders are different. That is why the uniform that they receive quite often is too narrow in some uh, areas and uh, too large in others. And that's about comfort, not so much about femininity, feeling like a woman. Above all, this is about comfort, feeling comfortable when uh, pursuing the uh, objectives. For example, in uh, our uniform, the waistline is very high, and that is, uh, the girls say that it is convenient because uh, they do not, uh, the trousers uh, can be uh, adjusted, and uh, also all the sizes. Well, I know that quite often girls. They say that uh, the lower part should be one size and the upper part another size, but uh, male sizes do not uh, are not in line with what they need. And for our uniform, the, these problems almost never arise because uh, we make it so that it is possible to arrange uh, the Velcro and uh, it is uh, uh, so it is possible to adjust the uniform to this type individual type of the figure and that is much more comfortable the parliaments of the 8th and 9th convocation invested a lot of effort so that the ukrainian army um, developed according to nato standards and the full-fledged attack unfortunately sped up this process now the minister of defense is speaking about that and leaders of our state but you were also inspired actually by nato experience because nato they also uh, produce uh, gender uh, gender specific uniform Yes, that's true. We developed 
our patterns based on the experience of NATO countries, in particular uniform for women that uh, we received from the U.S., even though actually we received a lot of uh, um, samples from Israel, uh, from other countries. We have a mini museum of uniforms, and for NATO uniform on the labels, it is even indicated combat female uniform. So this is the uniform for women to be used in warfare. And based on those standards, these are the standards that we were guided when we developed our patterns for women's uniform when we did that within Project uh, uh, Arm Women Now. So you are not supported from the state budget, right? Everything that you are doing, you are doing that due to the involved Ukrainians who transfer their money. And of course, all Ukrainians want Ukrainian women to have access to this uniform, maybe to several uh, uniforms per capita. So how is it possible to transfer money to you? I'm so grateful for this question. Yes, that's true. That's a problem. Um, we always lack money because we are a social initiative. We are not a commercial enterprise. We do not sell our uniform. We um, provide it free of charge to women in the front line. We have an Instagram page, Arm Women Now, and we have a website armwomennow.com and there you can see links to donation pages. We have an NGO account that is also possible to transfer money uh, to uh, monobank account. So there are various opportunities to do that, options, and we are so grateful for all amounts of money, because we receive uh, even 10 grivnas, 20 grivnas. That's what matters for us, because this is a drop in the ocean that makes the ocean full. And uh, due to these donations, we can go on producing these uniforms and uh, providing our women with those. Uh, now it is uh, winter coming and we are developing and producing winter uniform. Of course, the more people get to know about you, the more they are ready to support you. And thank you so much for this incredible initiative because uh, the women, they are protecting us at the front line. And of course, we need to support them. Evgenia Velika, Arm Women Now project. Thank you.
As in Holy Scripture, it is stipulated that a lot of us are called, but few of us are uh, the chosen ones. Uh, but everyone who wanted to be here, they are here. I'm Vadim Karpiak. I'm a journalist, and it's my honor today to uh, moderate this uh, rather untraditional discussion for Women's Congress with uh, uh, military chaplain Andrei Zelinsky. Welcome. And uh, frankly speaking, it is a bit uh, difficult for me to introduce you because the list of your titles, your CV in your uh, church and in your uh, uh, everyday life, that's quite long. A military chaplain and uh, the teacher of uh, uh, lecturer at the Ukrainian Catholic University, member and uh, of the Supervisory Council of the Ukrainian Leadership Academy and so on and so forth. In order to focus more, because values to a great extent, they depend on the position or on attitude of the people. So who do you feel you are above all? out of this long list of titles. I feel like a human being, and that's important. Above all, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that list, because actually this is not so much about the level of recognition. That's above all about functions, about opportunities to change. And that's about freedom. Because being a human being, it is about being multidimensional, where at every phase of life, uh, you can uh, consider, you can come to realize the most important resource, and that's about free freedom. And uh, uh, each of the dimensions that you have mentioned, that is a manifestation of humanity in various aspects of uh, uh, the uh, life. I agree, but we start uh, perceiving these values when we lose them. When we don't have enough oxygen, we understand how important oxygen is for our existence. But now, when nobody thinks about lack of uh, oxygen, we do not think about how valuable it is. Hence my question, and this is where I would like to start. You uh, lead the chaplain service of Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. And formally, we have like three to four uh, official chaplains in Ukraine. Now, it's just that we are now in the process of transformation of the chaplain movement. Uh, and uh, in Ukraine, since November last year, the law on military chaplains has been enacted. And now we have some unforeseen circumstances that, of course, starting in February, uh, launched the process, catalyzed the process of military chaplains coming to uh, military positions in the army. So this is a NATO standard, actually. This is adaptation to the conditions, uh, to the situation of the globalized world, international community. But what I mean is that while this process is ongoing, formally, military chaplains that are now service persons who serve as uh, uh, fish, uh, or as officers in the army, there are very few of them so far. That's important because we need to keep in mind that this uh, Chaplain Institute is developing. Yes, this is work in progress. But you are a practitioner. I would even dare say that when we speak about ch chaplainship, for many people, uh, you are kind of a collective image of a chaplain. So you define yourself as a human being above all. At this Congress, several times we have heard uh, statistics about that uh, there are more uh, women in the Ukrainian army than what's average for NATO countries. And we also know that mostly it's women who are mm, parishers who uh, come to church in Ukraine. So do you feel any, do you see any transformations in your chaplain practice? I mean, whether women come to you as a chaplain, if they come with their spiritual needs? Hence, my next question is if there are any differences, if you can see any value-based differences, because we all um, identify as human beings, but men and women may have different values and priorities. Do you uh, see that as a chaplain? At the beginning of this discussion, you said you uh, said something important that we start 
realizing how valuable oxygen is when we start lacking oxygen. And this is why I mentioned that, above all, I'm a human being. I'm an individual, because we are now at the stage of uh, development of history of humankind, humankind when the value of uh, humanity, of uh, what's humane, is under threat. And this is about this oxygen that's lacking. That's a global and very important challenge. And this is what we need to focus on now if we speak about the value based development of an individual and about survival in the situation of the full-fledged Russian aggression against Ukraine and in the context of all the uh, consequences of that aggression for the modern culture and humanity at the global level. So what's important is to contextualize, to define the coordinates of our most important value, that is the um, humane uh, attitude. Because uh, if we focus on this value, unless we focus on that value, there will be total chaos. And values, that's not about declarations. We may come up with nice words on uh, as slogans, but that will not change our society. And we have had many years of experience because value, it is something transformative. And that's only relevant when uh, the individual decisions are based on values. I mean, it doesn't matter if it is it happens in the army or in everyday life. And whether it is a man or a woman, if it is a child or a grown-up person. So we always make certain decisions. We, In this way, we shape our personality. Sometimes situation becomes uh, challenging and we face existential challenges as we are facing now. And there, it is so important that we can ground on pre-formed and maybe not yet uh, realized uh, value matrix, where people start acting and making decisions based on the pre-formed values. And I would like to emphasize, because this is so important for the humanity now, that this should not be about decorations, I mean values. Either we understand how we develop them and uh, what uh, we should be guided by when we uh, bring up the next generations of Ukrainians or we may face unpredictable uh, consequences. I often ask questions to myself as the events developed in Bucha, in Erpin, Mariupol, Hostomel. So this is the 21st century, right? How do individuals developing in the civilization, civilized conditions of the 21st century, how is it possible that they behave like that? How come this atrocities are witnessed? I believe many people ask this question to themselves. It is not really provoked because it is easy to explain aggressive behavior when people are provoked. But if they are not provoked, how come? And uh, for me, this is a um, test, actually, the test of uh, how the culture that develops under totalitarian regime is different from a democratic culture. You should just analyze the discourse. The discourse in Russia at all the levels, formal, political, folklore discourse, so the word uh, freedom, how often do you hear this word there? In order that we could uh, assume that the results of our actions will have certain quality and that I can now impact, influence uh, the consequences of what I do, I need to even unconsciously have a mechanism that makes it possible for me to understand that I can make my choice, that what I do results in certain consequences. I may make a mistake, and that is fundamentally true. And uh, I often ask myself why so many service persons uh, from Russia maybe often in the situations that look quite tragic to us, why don't they ask this question to themselves? Because they do not have the value of freedom.
Because they don't sing songs about this, because um, they did not learn about this since childhood, because they are military chaplains engaged in propaganda instead of protecting humanity. So coming back to your question, that was a long introduction. I will be brief, but the mission of a chaplain, which I comment on quite often, is to protect humanity in the military. It is about humanity, when our ability to be human, but this, you know, this also has its own value coordinates. There is no such thing as abstract humanity. It is. Uh, just as big of a threat on the other side of the spectrum as humanity fully guided by the state. And these two radical uh, dimensions of the value spectrum is when humanity is defined by state institutions, which we also went through. And on the other hand, it's when mm, it is not at all defined and not even mentioned at the official level. And it's like everyone is f a friend, but let's not uh, engage in extra violence. And then it threatens the human. These values are not abstract notions. Uh, they, you can't find them in cities. They live in the human heart, in the human mind, in the realm of human consciousness where decision making is taking place at the battlefield or in the context of more or less peaceful um, uh, environment. You are basically an advocate of Kant because uh, uh, he is the philosopher who advocated that uh, it is about humanity. But uh, as you said, uh, during the war, your main task as a chaplain is to uh, maintain humanity in these conditions. And the ideas of morals and humanity are very recent. They are maybe 10,000 years old, and the modern notions have emerged only very recently. How do we allow that humanity prevail over instinctive actions? Like when we uh, are exist in cold weather, we need uh, more food. When we need something sweet, we eat sugar and so on. How do you handle that? In the situation of the war, when the main task is surviving and the person has no time, you know, there is this good uh, theory of um, uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, about uh, uh, fast and slow thinking. When a person is stressed, they don't have time to process everything with their homo sapiens brain. It is not about values, it's about survival. So in the situation of a war, when there is frequent shelling, when there is a death right next to you, how do you find the strength to maintain that humanity? A human starts with freedom, but doesn't end with freedom. A human is not only about freedom, but also about interdependence. And the question is, what values and principles are interdependence in society is based on? Because interdependence can be based on fear, on violence, but also it can be based on certain values. When a person understands how important it is to help, how important it is to feel the entire potential of your humanity when you uh, interact beyond your personality with your freedom, when you're trying to create sort of an added value. This is something that humans engage in. We have already uh, evolve into a society where a human is considered something valuable. There is no such thing as a completely abstract animal level. There is a, a set of algorithms formed in the process of personality development. And it depends on us a lot. It depends on whether we will be able to handle the challenges of today and whether we will be able to build a quality society in Ukraine tomorrow. And this all depends on us. There is no such thing as abstract humanity. I usually use four um, axes of uh, coordinates that you can use and share. 
This value uh, matrix can help us uh, perform our important functions during uh, situations of stress or when we have no time to think. For me, being human is four important coordinates which define our humanity. The first one is the ability to seek truth. The second one is the ability to choose the good. The third, protect justice. And fourth, observe beauty. Yes, even in the conditions of the human reality destroyed by the war, truth, justice, and beauty. So, of course, aggression is our first de de defense mechanism. But for a long period of time, we have been trying to uh, put ourselves into an attitude of very strong resistance. But it is important that we don't lose something important. It is an important resource that we can invest into our future. Humanity, ability to seek truth, good, justice, and beauty. Uh, by the way, the part about observing beauty, is, um, it so happens that I have been a chaplain since 2006, and in uh, 2014 I was the first chaplain appointed in the ATO headquarters, and the, for the first three years I was fully in, in the trenches, and then uh, my career continued. But I all often liked saying that I know what the front line looks like. That's where our personality is fully focused on things that help us survive in the situation of a radical threat. Everything else, everything secondary um, uh, seems to disappear, to dissipate, and something else becomes a priority. And that's where beauty of our humanity shines through. And the first text I wrote back in 2014 from the area of ATO back then. It was called the um, zone of authenticity. It was about a context where statuses and wealth seemed to lose their importance. And we stayed with things that helped us remain human. We need mirrors that reflect the beauty of our humanity. In other words, we need people who share our system of values. It's very important. In fact, we form our personality in the process of realization of how other people think of us. It's like we mop up all reactions that people have to us. And when these reactions are something bright and vivid and light, it's something that we can use as building blocks to form our personality. Why else is it important? It's also important in those radical conditions, the front line where you need to protect yourself, where you need to be aggressive because otherwise, because otherwise or else. And that's where your own identity emerges, especially the identity of a person whom I tend to call um, human warrior. A warrior is not necessarily a soldier. Uh, a soldier, a military servant is a status, it is an official um, a uh, position. A warrior is a type of personality. It can be over there, it can be here in Kiev. It is a person dedicated to victory. That is, it is a, a person who doesn't allow himself or herself to become complacent or to um, get reduced to instincts. It is a person operating certain values. The question is why? Why are you here? And it changes everything. I really like that you are speaking about these building blocks because when we are saying about this top level of values, we have to realize that in order to achieve it, we need to have certain basic values provided in everyday, somewhat boring life. And Women's Congress, where we are currently located, promotes this value of justice in gender issues and equality year after year. And I personally mm, notice how after February 24th, society is taking significant steps in this direction. By the way, you have just uh, uh, spoken about a warrior. Uh, I liked it and I thought of Herodot and Amazons who lived in the Ukrainian territory. 
we uh, don't have don't have a feminine form of the word warrior we do at least in literature yeah but it is not quite as common what am I saying here we have this challenge of equality and how to achieve it but we also have a point when a lot of people in Ukraine, and Ukraine is quite a religious country with significant ties to church, where 60 to 70 percent of people attend churches regularly. And um, I have this sort of marginal question, but I can ask you, can church catch up with this reconstruction of society? To be clear, I can provide a brief illustration. Hmm. I was recently present at a church wedding of a couple I knew, and it was a very touching moment. But when both newlyweds uh, were uh, they mm, both uh, said their oath. She promised obedience. He did not promise obedience. It was phrased in this sort of unusual way. So I would say, uh, uh, I would ask how you feel about it, because church is a, a sort of value lighthouse for many people. Can the church catch up? Because now we are speaking about a reassessment of values in terms of gender balance. I will go back with what I started. Values are not abstract notions. They are specific mechanisms to make personal decisions. And if we speak about values in that format, I don't see any obstacles for the church to catch up with its most important mission. Church is not just an institution meant to uh, implement a certain program for a specific uh, social and historic context. It's some, about something bigger, something more. Something that I pointed out multiple times is focusing on what is human, focusing on humanity. I have just defined those four coordinates of humanity, seeking truth, uh, kindness, justice, and beauty. And it so happened that as people, we are getting the first taste of those important values that later become a criterion of decision making for us. They are formed back in the family. And this is something um, that we should think about, that the Ukrainian family should think about today, the situation in which we are today, about values forming a Ukrainian person. And I should point out the responsibility of parents in the child's understanding of what freedom is, what dignity is. We have two key fundamental values in our ideological quest. We can jump from paradigm to paradigm, but how do we formalize our national idea or a certain set of fundamental um, values? Here they are. We don't have enough words, we don't have enough texts to, ca uh, to catch it. I'm, I'm coming back. You know, I am I'm starting from far so that you understand where I'm coming from. If the family understands this value of value-based formation of personality, of a human, of a citizen, it is an entire set of social roles and functions. So when this function is understood, that means that both parents understand their crucial role in the future architecture of society. Uh, is the uh, church able to keep up? Church has its own mission in society. It is about the truth that provided those human values to humanity. I have mentioned freedom and purpose because uh, there, is, there is more freedom in the New Testament than in parts of the Old Testament. 
The point is how we understand and how we interpret it today, and that's highly important. I. So, sorry, you focused on church and family. That's what you asked. Yeah, but I will follow up because there was this wonderful uh, Ukrainian teacher, educator, Hyor Hivashenko, who said that there are five factors affecting uh, this personality, um, street, school, NGO, family, and church. That is what is called disciplinary societies in the modern human society. And an important institution for us uh, back then and today is the armed forces of Ukraine. I honestly say that the armed forces of Ukraine have to become the school of life, because otherwise we have a big gap in tomorrow's architecture of Ukrainian society. That's why there is a doctrine for the development of military leadership in the armed forces of Ukraine already, clearly postulating a set of values for a Ukrainian soldier and a warrior as a type of personality. But I am speaking about a sort of social concert. This has to be interaction of various entities that uh, broadcast those values. But like I said, as long as values aren't used for decision making, it does not affect anything. It doesn't change anything. The armed forces of Ukraine now have an incredible opportunity to carry out value-based transformation of the entire society. It was mentioned multiple times in the past nine months that the armed forces of Ukraine are uh, undertaking the religious function partially. There is a phrase, I believe, in the armed forces of Ukraine. I have faith in the armed forces of Ukraine. And this concept of faith uh, is interesting because the armed forces of Ukraine have uh, chaplains, which is akin to church. They have become family for many people. They uh, act as an NGO because there are volunteers. There is also a school, as in they are a school of life, and there is also a street. And the influence of street is also very important, uh, which we noticed less today because the internet and social media are replacing it today very often. But even on social media, there is presence of the armed forces. We are, we are perfectly aligning with our timing, right? Yes, thanks to you. This is the value of precision that Ukrainians also need to learn to respect. And the last value which we haven't brought up, it is trust to yourself. We will not be able to notice the strength and beauty in people who surround us. We won't be able to believe in them and they won't be able to believe in themselves if we don't have faith in them. So I think the most important regulatory uh, switch for these dark times is courage to uh, not to let your light go out. It's also another important function for uh, Ukrainian society and Ukrainian women. Thank you. This is Father Zelensky. Dear guests, we have a break. Dear friends, in our story we continue our interviews and I'm very happy to welcome Ashley Mulroney, uh, Acting Ambassador for Canada. Thank you, it's very nice to be here. Thank you. Um, 
got uh, some question for you about women leadership. As you know, Ukrainian women demonstrate resilience and leadership during the large scale war in the Ukraine. They are fighting on the front line and in the rear. They organize humanitarian support, they keep running their businesses and start with the shows, social and rehabilitation projects. What is your impression about Ukrainian women? What inspire you maybe the most? Thank you. Well, let me first of all say thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be back at the Ukrainian Women's Congress in person. Um, despite the challenging circumstances, but this has always been a, a highlight of the year for us uh, at the Embassy of Canada. And I will say, this is my fourth year in Ukraine now, and uh, I must say that I am inspired every single day by Ukrainian women, by all Ukrainians, frankly, but, but really um, by all that Ukrainian women are doing. Frankly, I am exhausted watching you. Uh, I found my life has been difficult the last nine months, but it's a, it's a very different story for, for someone for whom this country is, is home, your permanent home. So I just want to express my deep and abiding respect for everything that, that Ukrainian women have been through. You know, the loss of home, the loss of uh, family members, uh, you know, disruption to your lives. It's, it's really uh, quite a shock. But I would say what inspires me most is probably the everyday things. That despite all of the challenges, despite not having water, or electricity, or internet, we all love our internet, don't we? Yeah. Um, despite all of these things, people are still going to work. They are still seeing their friends on Sunday afternoon and going for a walk in the park. They are still finding ways to find joy in life. Um, and I think this, to me, is the most impressive way of telling Russia and of telling Putin that that war will never be successful. He will never win. He will never beat Ukraine. Um, so my deep and abiding respect for that. But I would say, you know, despite that everyday act of defiance, um, that Russian women are indeed running their own businesses. And, and we saw it at the beginning of the war, how uh, women's organizations and women across the country found ways to inspire their organizations, to, to engage every day in helping their communities. And we, as the government of Canada, shifted our support very quickly to ensure that funding was available at the most basic local level. So they could buy diapers, they could buy, you know, f basic food items, blankets, whatever was needed at the most basic community level so that people could get by. Um, and all of our women's rights organizations that we have supported for years through the Ukrainian Women's Foundation, they all engaged in that process. They set up shelters for displacement people, they bought medicine, they, they helped in so many fundamental ways to just make life more manageable, more bearable on a daily basis. So I think that is what has moved me most. But, you know, we've also seen this really impressive shift of women at the local level to engaging in activism and politics um, that I think will be really important for the years to come. And I'll, I'll speak up to that a little bit later. But um, yeah, for me, what's most inspiring is really the everyday, that despite the challenges, despite the fact that you have to carry water up 25 floors in an apartment building, um, you know, despite the fact that sometimes you can't do laundry for days at a time because the electricity is never on at the right time, um, you know, there's still, people still smile and they want to live their lives. Thank you, because it's really, really important words. Uh, but um, how do you think women's leadership matters today? Um, maybe you can share your thoughts on how women influence and change our societies. Does women's leadership matter today? I think women's leadership matters every day. I think we need more women leaders in, in Ukraine, in Canada, everywhere in the world. Um, I think we... we will bring a different flavor to the table and I think we will make sure that that a broader diversity of views and, and needs are, are considered at that table. But one of the things I want to flag about the leadership we have seen in Ukraine in the last few months is the success uh, of the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. 
This was such a big day, and globally it was largely ignored because of everything else that was happening in, in Ukraine, but those of us, or in the world, but those of us who have fought for this for years uh, noticed what a, a massive shift that meant in, in politics, um, that the government really was focused on EU accession and, and recognized that this was, this was a barrier that was easy to, to vanquish, easy to get past. So to all the women's rights organizations that we have worked with for years um, and who, who made this possible, I, I want to say my, my profound respect for making that happen. Um, but I think, so, let's, so Istanbul Convention is certainly there and we will be pushing towards greater support for uh, uh, responding to gender-based violence. But I think what we also want to see is, is more women engaging in politics, not just now, but in peace negotiations and when, the, when the time comes and in recovering and helping to reconstruct the country. And there are so many women who are helping their community at a basic level every day who now have a platform. And we need to make sure that those women become the politicians of tomorrow, that we, that we use that gender quota that is in you know, the country's elections legislation, that we use that opportunity when martial law is ended to get women back to the table. But beforehand, we need to do it now too, but we shouldn't forget that opportunity, that just because it's men at the table now, that it's men that we see at the, uh, on the television, that we don't lose that opportunity after the war to really engage with all of those those new that new wave of politicians to me it's sort of like a, a post Maidan movement right you have all of these interesting activists who are coming to the forefront um, and we need to make sure that they have a platform that they have the knowledge and the funding and the you know the training to to take advantage of that opportunity of that moment we know that a Canada it's it's the biggest friend of Ukrainians, so I want to ask you about some, some kind of help. Women's leadership has to be supported, and you know about that, especially in a time of extraordinary challenges, like now. What are the key programs of the government of Canada in support of women, both, I mean, in Ukraine and in world world? What will contribute to promoting democracy and uh, human rights? So I think there, there's many components to your question, so I'll, I'll start from, by saying that Canada has had a feminist international assistance policy and a feminist foreign policy uh, since 2017. And this forces us to look at what are the needs of the most vulnerable in society and also to provide opportunities to empower women, to give them a voice, to give them a seat at the table. So through that policy and with the funding that it, it brings us, we have really worked hard to make sure we are supporting women leaders wherever they are. So with the National Democratic Institute, for example, in Ukraine, we have supported women's leaders to uh, to gain capacity to become political leaders, to sit at those, those important tables. We have also supported women's rights organizations, as I mentioned, through Ukrainian Women's Fund and through Pact Ukraine, to grow their networks, to build the feminist movement in Ukraine. And then we have long had uh, support to the efforts with UNFPA and others to prevent and respond to sexual and gender-based violence, recognizing that if women don't feel safe, then they can't contribute in the, to the same level uh, in their societies and their communities. So we've had a, a multifaceted approach, even in agriculture. We have supported women's farmers uh, and, the women, and women's farming associations. So we're always looking to find those opportunities to help elevate the voices of women, to empower them, to engage them in changing their societies. So in many different, in many different ways, we're trying to make that possible. And we will continue to do that through, uh, through all of the stages of the war through peace and recovery and reconstruction. I thank you. Thank you for your help to our country and sure for women leaderships. It's really important for our country. Thanks a lot and for this time too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Героям слава. Друзі, в гостях нас була Ешлі Малруні. Тим часом. So we talked to Ashley Malrooney, acting ambassador for Canada.